You're listening to Kingston Community Radio on WGHQ Kingston. On your radio at 920 AM and 92.5 FM. And also online at mykcr.org. Hi, I'm Kelsey Grammer. Wounded Warrior Project supports injured veterans by connecting them with fellow warriors, by serving them through mental health and wellness programs, and by empowering them to live on their own terms. No one should face a battle alone. Join us at WoundedWarriorProject.org. There was this one time I went snorkeling in the Caribbean when I was a kid. It really just blew my mind. We saw the most beautiful corals. I remember thinking they were waving at us as they moved with the ocean. And then there were all these amazing fish. I'll never forget it. It completely changed the way I look at the ocean. Most of us have a memory of being in nature we'll never forget. Let's protect the world's natural places so more memories can be made for generations to come. Visit worldwildlife.org. Long ago, you wouldn't think of galloping on a horse while doing calligraphy. And you wouldn't have attempted to ride your bike while typing a letter. Yet you think you can safely operate a multi-ton vehicle while texting? Behind the wheel is no place to multitask. If you want to BRB, drive now and text later. Lives depend on it. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Tony Marmo from Norman Staffing, and we've been bringing together employers and job seekers since 1980. If you're an employer and have job vacancies, let Norman Staffing help fill them with permanent or temporary workers. We screen, interview, and recommend the best candidates for your company. We make the employment process easier and faster for you. Please call Norman Staffing for your employment needs at 338-9111, 338-9111, or normanstaffing.com. Hi, this is Jared Manns from the Spring Lake Fire Department, and I support Kingston Community Radio, and so should you. This portion of Kingston Community Radio is brought to you by Ulster Savings Bank. Visit their newest branch, conveniently located at the Ulster Commons Plaza in Lake Katrine. Experience the difference that local community banking offers with the convenience of another great location, easy access, plenty of parking, and a 24-hour ATM. Ulster Savings Bank, invested in community, invested in you. Member FDIC. Okay. We're on? Yep. Yes, we are. Thank you. Good morning, Lawrence. Good morning, Bill Murphy. Uh, Good morning. I'm Fred Costello, and this is KCR on January 19th. I can't believe you're saying that. I know. Yeah. 2022. 2022. It's crazy. So, uh, the sun's coming up a little bit earlier, which is nice. Yeah, it's going to be 41 degrees today, too, which is even nicer. That's even nicer. Yeah, we paid our dues last week. But I guess it's, the cold's coming back, right? It is. Yeah, it's coming back a little bit. But, yeah, it's going to be really cold on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm going skiing, actually, on Friday. It's going to be extremely cold. Um, Friday night, it's supposed to be, like, minus 5. Ugh. That's uh, cold. And then Monday, it'll warm back up a little more again. Isn't right. that when Greg comes back? So he'll be gone for all the... He missed all the bad weather. He yeah, missed he'll the miss snowstorm. The yep. Exactly. He timed it just right. He timed it just right. He's got a, kind of a knack for that. Yeah, he's in Florida, right? No, not yet. There's um, um, He's part of a International Turf Crafts Association. Oh, that's where he's at yeah. this week. Oh, and okay. they have their annual convention. And uh, he took right. two... Huh? What do you do? Go there and talk grass? They talk grass. Yeah, what they talk thinking? grass. Hopefully but not, they but not cannabis either. grass. They just talk They talk just, rural yeah. grass. Perennial rye and bluegrass. But they, uh, it's quite a thing. And uh, one day we'll get him motivated. He'll talk about it on air. But it's impressive. So he'll yes. meet. He takes care of the town's facilities. And then there's counterparts like him all across the country that go. But also all the pre- professional sports fields. You know, he has that's, relationships wow, with folks crazy. that take care of the Arizona Stadium where they pull the grass inside and out and uh, areas like that. And it's truly a science to do that. And he's yeah. tremendously good at it. So I bet. No, he, he does go to that every year. Yeah. Speaking of grass, was uh, Kevin Cahill smoking grass when he wanted to raise the bottle tax to $0.10? Cents? Did, did you guys read that in the paper? He talked about that on here. Yeah. 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 Not last, yeah, last time. Yeah, yeah we talked about it, but we, we were talking more about flights and stuff like that. Is he out of his mind? Like, we don't pay enough taxes already? Yeah. yeah. I mean, come on, man. 
Like, if you got to go and get a bill passed back in Albany, why don't you go back up there and get the bail reform thing straightened out instead of us paying more taxes? <laughs> For Christ's sake, man. I think that's something that we're going to see happen, though, because especially— I think other states have done it. Other states have done it. Like, Maine what, is re- 15 re- cents. What? The, what the, the, the bottle bag, return. The, well, Mi- Michigan and Hawaii and Iowa, I think, do 10 cents. Yeah. 10 cents? Yeah, yeah. There are this means when I go buy a case of water, it's going to cost an extra dollar twenty. Well, didn't, didn't you watch? Didn't you watch Seinfeld where Kramer had to load up the mail truck? And yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Wanted, yeah. Him and yeah. Newman wanted to load up the truck and drive yeah. to Michigan. Michigan. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did watch that episode. Yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 I get it. I mean, you know, let's say, I mean, honestly, I look at one side of it, and for the people out there who go out and they collect bottles and turn them in, that's good for them. Good for them. That's you know, nice. it's a nice raise. And, uh, and again, you know, but then for the consumer who every time they got to buy a six pack or something like that, got to pay an extra 30 cents. I get that side of it too. I don't yeah. drink beer, you know, so I don't have that issue. Well, it's not just beer, it's water. Oh, it's I know, much I know, but, like, you, but I'm saying you buy, a buy bottle, you buy a bottle of water or a can of soda, it's an extra nickel. You buy a six pack or a 12 pack, an extra 30 cents, 60 right, cents. That's right. where people see the difference. But I mean, aren't we paying enough taxes in New York already? I mean, geez. well, yes, However, we are. We are. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> However, the the big thing I th- that I think is underlying that conversation happening now is the landfills that were uh, permitted 20 years ago are all filling up, and the one that we use here in Ulster County is filling up, and it's scheduled to close right. over the next five years. And when that happens, there's going to be a huge solid waste crisis again, and there's concern amongst Sargates and other communities that were targeted for regional landfills. If, and if we don't fix the crime problem, there's not going to be any residents here to put any trash in the trash bin. So I didn't hear your whole point. If we don't yeah. fix the crime, is that right? Oh, yeah. Well, I understood. But there's a you know you can't just fix one problem. You kind of have to look at them all. Good point. And solid waste is definitely going to be come uh, at the forefront of conversations. I know uh, Bill and I are part of the Ulster County Mayors and Supervisors Association. And that conversation's come up a number of times in that organization. And Did you work? I didn't. Take, I wasn't on the call yesterday. Were you? I was on the call yesterday. Oh, see, that's good. I was on one before you weren't, and you're yeah, on this one. So we cover each other. Good. Yeah, I saw the emails from over the weekend, and then by the time I got them, I was. Yep. I was kind of late. Uh, Successful. Uh, the leadership did not change at all. Uh, Are they voted? Okay. Yeah, Supervisor Quizgley. Uh, Mary Rogers and Supervisor Baden mm-hmm. are going to be the leadership again. Jeannie stayed on as uh, secretary, and uh, I can't wait till we start meeting. I, I just started going to the live meetings at the diners, and then all of a sudden COVID hit. You know? Yeah, and I enjoyed those couple once I went to it. Di- you know, because I I wasn't going to them. You were representing, and you know, obviously my day job made it difficult for me to go to them. And then I found a way to start going to them, and uh, you know, it was enjoyable. I find it therapeutic. Yeah. Because you go there and hear about everybody else's problems the same as yours. You're like, okay. All right. I say, no, I'm not crazy. Yeah. I I had a good one yesterday. I'm not going to even say what the story was. But, I mean, somebody called me yesterday with a problem. And I I finally snapped. And not a bad way. It's somebody I know. I said, honestly, why? They called my office. It was urgent to have to talk to the mayor. And then I'm like, when I got talking to him, I'm like, this was urgent that you had to talk to me about. Right now, drop everything and take that on. I said, just because you know me. I mean, you know, and again, I love, I take phone calls at home, text. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, you know, I was busy. And I'm like, anybody in my office can answer this question for you. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I just, I, I and part of it's because I put myself out there too much. I realized that. And just like you do, we're social. Yeah. We talk to people. And I get it. And I love helping people. But it was just like, it was just the, the morning I was having. And I'm like, really? This was mm-hmm. urgent where I had to drop off this call to take your call? Mm-hmm. And this is what it was? You know? But, uh, you know, we kind of laughed about it afterwards. But it was just like, you know, just one of those days where I just, was, you know, as I call them, I call them, uh, uh, I won't use the actual word, but blank hole Monday. Because everything that happens over the weekend oh, festers. Every time we get a Monday off, the Tuesdays and oh, every, yeah. But if you get yeah, if you have a Monday off, then it's then it's yeah. real double blank hole every Tuesdays time, because yeah. you have four days of people festering with an issue. Yeah, and they can't wait to get a hold of you. And uh, that's why I, I Mondays like I come in the office and I'm like, all right, what? Well, cringe as you're walking, opening yeah. the door and figuring out what's coming. But yeah, yeah. those long weekends. They come at a price. And, you know, sometimes I will 
answer emails on the weekends. You know, I try not to. I mean, I try to not bother the weekend. If something's urgent enough, I'll get a text or a call. But, you know, it's like, but yeah, things definitely fester. And then, not only that, but we had Monday a holiday and a snowstorm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was a lot. That made for triple complaints on yeah. Tuesday. You know, sure did. But I think, I mean, I know in the village, my guys did a good job getting the roads cleared off. Uh, it wasn't an easy storm because it was heavy, wet, and and then we had the rain on top of it. And uh, and I know someone asked last night if we are going to do the snow removal in the village. You know, we get it all off the streets. And uh, we're actually going to hold off to see what this next storm coming is because it was, it was kind of a marginal storm. Like, the snow banks on the you business. You can are, still park. You can still park, right. And a little bit cautious getting to the sidewalk, but you can park. And, you know, you know, obviously you got to be cautious, can't, cautious of overtime and, you know, and all that. So if another storm is, in fact, coming this weekend, then we're going to hold off to after this storm and then get it all in one shot. But if that's, if we find out in the next two days that it's not going to hit us, then we will try to get it done before the weekend. Okay. Sure. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah. So, because when they do that, I mean, literally, it looks like it doesn't even, didn't even snow on yeah. the business district. Yeah. Those guys do a great job, you know. And obviously, the town guys help us out as well. And uh, you know, the steer skid, and and it's it's a nice yeah. feat. It's a nice thing to be able to do in the village, yeah. you know, for the businesses and the people parking. But uh, I came up in last night's meeting because our Monday meeting was last night, and when there's a holiday, and uh, Rich told me he's, he he was going to wait today and see what the forecast is coming. Yeah, that seems reasonable. If we get heavy snow, you're going to be doing the same work twice. Well, I think we only got five inches, and usually our, usually our measuring thing is six inches or above. That's when we make sure we get rid of the snow. We lost a little bit, too, because of the rain and the right. decent weather so far. Yeah. So, you know, I, it'll – you're going to get to it, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. If we need to be. And uh, what, are we ha- expecting some heavy snow this weekend? Are That's we- what he said at the meeting last night. Then I was watching the news last night. Flipping back, they said, and I didn't stay on the channel long enough to listen, but, you know, Channel 7, like I said, they'll talk about a potential storm coming this weekend. So I didn't really, I think I flipped back to the basketball game and didn't really listen for what it was. So we'll see. Find out today. Yeah. Yeah. So I was life in the town. How are things going? We had the same thing with the snow. Uh Ray Mayone is the new highway superintendent. He took office January 1st. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny how things roll because we had such a mild fall early right. winter. And Mr. Meyer, who was a veteran at it and experienced and certainly knew the hot spots we had to be concerned about, didn't really get a storm. And so he left kind of skating through. <laughs> and as soon as Mr. Mayone took office, he got hammered with that ice storm. And now he got this storm, which is a little bit difficult to take care of, as you pointed out. Right. And uh, But, you know, we got... The, the the employees that work for the town and the village, you know they 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 take a lot of criticism that's unnecessary. They do a really great job. Uh, they go out there, they're dedicated. They went out Sunday night just before midnight, and they stayed out till s- Sunday morning, about right before noon. They went left, and by the time they left, every road in town was passable. Yeah, and uh, you know we had very few breakdowns, and we did they did a really great job. So, you know, we take them for granted because when we get up in the morning and we go out there nine times out of ten, the roads are ready to go. Well, that's, you know, the previous storm we had, I think, I think I spoke out on the last call, I think it was the last week in December or whatever, we had that, you know, it wasn't a major, it was like a couple inches or whatever, yeah. and my guys were out at 2 o'clock in the morning because, oh, yeah, I think it was, uh, might have been New Year's Eve, whatever day, yeah, New Year's Eve, it was yep, a holiday. Yep. And I got phone calls complaining that they were out too early. <laughs> How do you win that? And I'm like, well, you know, for the people who had to go to work that day, they, I'm sure they're appreciative of it. You know, I'm sorry you don't have to go to work and you were planning on sleeping in and the plow woke you up, but, you know. <laughs> Another component to that, and if you needed an ambulance or a fire truck, right, you certainly need the road to be safe for them to get there. And plus it was a holiday, no matter what the guys were getting, time and a half, whatever it was, and they wanted to come in early and get done early. Mm-hmm. We get to enjoy the day. It was New Year's Eve. Yeah. You know, they didn't want to be out till 6, 7 o'clock oh, on New Year's yeah. Eve. That's fair. You know, and uh, and I was like, you know, for your, you know, if they, and it's and it's funny because I, that same day, I heard the issues in Kingston and people were complaining the plows came out too late in Kingston that yeah. day. 
Because no good deed goes unpunished. You know. That. So I was like, um, and I even said it to one of the people that called me. I said, "Well, do you see him King Simmer to complain and the plows came out too late?" Mm -hmm. You know, who's right? My son, me, Mayor Noble, who? You know. Yeah, uh, you're fortunate because you have Rich, and you just you know let him make that call and. Well, we converse. I mean, even like Monday night, I called him up, told him the roads were in good shape. I said, what are your plans on Tuesday? He goes, I think I'm going to come in early, so let me take a ride around the village. I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. I said, well, why don't you bring you guys in at 5? Just make sure you, you, anything needs to be done before people start going to work. Mm -hmm. you know, get the guys in early. They can, you know, if you want, they want to leave early, go home early, and that's fine. But, you know, get, get in two hours before people start getting up go to work and make sure everything's clear because you do, like, you know, you do have the, the professional home plowers who, like, after the roads are done, like to push all the snow out on the road. Street, correct, yeah. <laughs> so, Which is not legal. Legal, <laughs> no. yeah, so don't do it. And I didn't see too many issues. I mean, when I went in the village, I only saw a couple of them. So we've been, we stay on top of them. And, and I get it sometimes, especially the big storm, where people don't know where to put the snow. Yeah, I get it too. But it's, you know, you, you, you could create a hazardous situation. Absolutely, absolutely. You create ice in the road, you can create anything, you know. Yeah. So. Don't do it in. But, you know, we, they keep us surprised, and generally they just go do what they need to do. Don't complain about it and get it done. And they do a nice job with it. We don't think of them so much as first responders, but I know. Uh, yeah, they are. The f yeah, it, we, it, you and I have been together during uh, flooding situations and wind situations and snow, obviously. And, uh, you know, generally the first call is with the police department, and then the second call is to the highway superintendent to yep. figure out, you know, what's going on, where we have closures, how we doing with Central Hudson, and uh, for the most part, they get it done. I don't know why we felt overwhelmed, but. Not only that, but, you know, uh, you know, say trees down, who are the first people we call? Our highway DPW departments. Right away. You know, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of, they are, to me, they are first responders, because, I mean, at least, I know, especially for me, with DPW, you know, I was coming, my DPW is a little different than the highway department, you know, they have, a, it's a little broader range mm -hmm. of what they do, but, you know, it's almost any time there's an emergency somehow or, or some way, they're involved. They're involved yeah. They end up involved. Yeah. I mean, a water break. Yep. You know, uh, you name it. You know, they're out there, and uh, you know, so they're, I can I consider them definitely. You know, yeah. they're obviously not in the level of paramedics, firemen, and policemen, but they're definitely, you know, for for the integrity of the village, they're definitely first responders. Agreed. That's true for the town too. They in you know, the police and firemen can't really do their job without them being successful at their job. You're, yep. you know, you're not going to go out there. Well, answering calls with a police car that's not four wheel drive if you can't pass the road. And I, like we had that fire call last week, right across the street from Village Hall. Yep. The house that burned down. That was a week ago today. Go well, today. Yeah. We we actually, matter of fact, my office called it air. in. My cop's sitting in the office. He saw the flames and he called it in. Mm -hmm. And but going to DPW, what happened was they were fighting the fire. It was an extremely cold day. The road was freezing up. DPW came down, put sand down. So this the firemen, so it was, well, you know, fell room be fell, down. you know, so right there, they're helping out the fire department, yeah. you know. So, yeah, that was, that was I, I mean, I felt so bad. The new owners had just bought it in November, and and then the, it was a father and son, and the son was moving into his home. And then he came to the office, and he was just so upset. He just started moving stuff in the night before. Uh. You know, and yeah, that was tragic. You know, between the fire departments, Sergey's Glasgow. I mean, I don't know who else was there. I know Sergey's in Glasgow were there. I mean, they did a tremendous job getting it quick, and they saved the house. Centerville, Centerville they saved the house, yeah. no question about it. You know, uh, I think it's structurally sound, and they kept most of the. I think the, the fire damage was to the second floor, but then obviously water damage on the first floor. So they uh, they tarped it off. So yeah, the intentions are to keep it. Yeah, we actually that day we met with the owner. We said, listen, you need to call Center Pro. And we got hold, of, you know, we gave him the number. Sir Pro was there within an hour because, said, you know, we wanted to board it up, and make sure nothing froze overnight, mm -hmm. and because of that water stayed on the floor and it froze, it got damaged all the floors, and mm -hmm. you know, so Al did a great job working with the owner to make sure, you know, we got it boarded up and secured, and you know, hopefully they'll be able to rebuild. It's a beautiful house, you know, and just a shame. You hate to see anybody. You know, I'm fortunate. Fortunately, nobody was in the house when it happened. That's. That was our thought, too. You know, it was the wrong time. It's never a good time, but, you know, this time of year, especially with the bad weather, if people get displaced, it's tragic. Right. And uh, it's tragic always, but there's just that extra level of it happening this time of year, and uh, no one was in it, so right. there wasn't any risk to human life. Compared to the, the recent fires in New York City and Philadelphia, you know? Yeah. And yes, they do. No. Unbelievable. So, 
Yep, yep. Well, it's exciting. Yeah. So, uh, when you see those stories, doesn't it kind of catch you by surprise? It feels like those big fires are something that belong in the history books and we don't have them anymore, but you can't have them. <laughs> yeah. It's scary. And yeah, we got. Uh, the other fire in the village, was that three years ago already? Where the yep. individual lost their life? Yep, yep. I was born, I bet you I was. <laughs> I bet you it was like I bet you it was closer to four or five years ago. Yeah, I, time goes quick. Yeah, it's at least four years ago. Minimum four years ago it was definitely Th that I know. And the only reason I know that is because Jacqueline had an AAU game that day. Her last year of AAU was her junior year in high school. Okay, and so she's a junior year, in college. Yeah. So a minimum was four years ago, and it could have even been an earlier year than that. Cause I remember I went to the fire early in the morning, and then we had to go to Connecticut for a game that day. And I was getting updates while I was in Connecticut of what was going on. So that's, you know, just one of those things. You remember where you were and what you did that day. I remember the league court giving out donuts and serving, you know. Yeah. Mayor Mayor Brendan came in and opened up pizzas and gave out pizzas to the firefighters. And I remember what a great come together day it was yeah, for the community. It was, yep. Yeah, it really was. And obviously very unfortunate for the families that were there. And, you know, not only one person passed, but there was a couple of people seriously injured, seriously burnt. It was a, yeah. it was a terrible fire. You know, and uh, so, but yeah, definitely at least four years ago, if not longer. It's crazy. Yeah, time goes really fast. Wow, I'm 56. How old are you? 50, I'll be 53 next week. Whew, man. Thanks for announcing that on air, by the way. What's that? Thanks for announcing that on air. I know, I announced I'm 56. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel it or act it, at least I try. But, I definitely you know, don't act it, I'm still immature. But I'm very immature. I'm, yeah. I'm maybe 19, if that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait to turn legal. <laughs> no. It, uh, it goes quick. It's my fun. kids are older than me now. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, my mother, my father-in-law was one of those guys. He was uh, 29 every birthday. So. Oh, yeah. My mother was 39 for her, uh, until Timmy turned 40. Then she really she had to up it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. We found out her oldest kid was older than her. She had to up it a little bit. Yeah. Try to go and sell that anymore. Yeah. Maybe she was born on a leap year. Leap year. Yeah. 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 It was fun. Yep. So both my girls are back at school, back to the empty nesting at home. Jack went back last Sunday, and Jill went back this past Sunday to Boston. So uh, adjusting again. You know, we just started adjusting to the empty nesting, then they're home for five weeks for Christmas break, and it was nice having them home again. Now we're back to adjusting again. Not easy, right? It's, it was funny. Even Dana and I were talking last night. It was, like, weird because, you know, I don't know. Like, Jill actually, Jill loved her first semester at Northeastern, you know, she loved being in Boston, but she went back, and she actually was, like, called a Sunday night, and she was upset, and, you know, it was her first time going back after being home for a break, I think. Yeah, and, she missed it a different way. Yeah, but, you know, she's obviously loves being, but then she sends me a picture yesterday, she goes, Dad, I think somebody was murdered across from my dorm, and there's all yellow tape around a policeman around. Send that to your dad? We don't need <laughs> like, to know about that. Right, well, she's right in downtown, you know, right in the heart of Boston. But it's a nice section. It's a very nice section of Boston. I said, well, you know, I never got the final details. But you sent me a picture of police tape and police been walking around at a park across from where a dorm is. I'm like, okay, <laughs> stay inside. Yeah, good luck getting some sleep that night. Yeah, don't go jogging. Don't, yeah. don't go jogging today, Jill. I mean, so uh, that's the hard part, you know. You know, worried about your kids. One, I got one in South Carolina, one in Boston. So it's it's difficult worrying about them. But you know, thank God for modern technology. I mean, literally. I get to see my kids every day. Yeah, they're amazing. FaceTiming and talking. I mean, during the day, you get updates on this and that. And, you know, and you know, yesterday, Jack texted me all day. Hey, Dad, you know, there's an asteroid coming by here, you know, at 4 o'clock or whatever. And I'm like, see you know, it? no, I forgot. Did you? No, I forgot, too. They said if you, you want to I was post excited about it. I was, too. And then I just got busy and doing stuff because last night, my our youth basketball league started up last night. So I had a crazy day getting everything prepped. You know, we started games at Riccardi last night. And, uh, you know, we have over... I think almost 350 kids in the program this year and that's a nice turnout yeah you know and again this for you because we didn't do it for two years right one year one year okay. the year before we stopped with about a month ago in the season okay and you know this year you know i decided to kind of after 30 years to let go of the reins a little bit and uh you know i got john parisio and greg to sell you know helped me a lot this year mike tiano who's who started the five to eight year program for us uh so it's nice this year i got you know, put more onus on the parents a little more, you know, and my days of being down there every night keeping score and refing are just done. <laughs> you know? oh, did it. 
20 what? 32. 30, yeah, it's a pretty well, 30 time. something. I started 88. But no, and I love the kids and I love basketball, you know. And But I just don't, you know, I mean, Dan and I to laugh because before we had kids, I mean, we were literally there every night together as a couple, you know, keeping score. And and, and then obviously my kids played in the league. And uh, But it's just, it's, it's, and it's hard to let go. Like, the new guys, John and Greg, they all come up with new ideas this year. And I'm like, and they're great ideas. It's great to get new thinking, mm-hmm. you know, how we run the, pro, you know. But it's hard to let go. Like, yeah. you know, like last night, I'm texting the refs at 930. Okay, how everything go tonight? You know, any problems? And, you know, let me know. if Because obviously this. You're going to have a parental perspective on it. You did it for all those years. Yeah. Congratulations, because you're in kind of in rare air. You know, Gladys Hutton was legendary for her dedication to the Little League. Uh, the Winters family dedication to SAA. Hey, you know, for no, decades, but there's not a lot of. Well, no, another person, Greg Gasell. Greg Gasell <laughs> ran Little League for <sighs> forever. Yeah. And he just doesn't go, you know, and he's the one this year that Murphy need help. I'll step up and help you. And it's nice because Greg and I are old friends and we kind of think the same way. And, uh, and getting get in my. My new buddy, John Parisio, coming up, and John's got kids. And, you know, obviously Mike Tiano's been involved with me for a few years. And Mike's, you know, it's nice because we all love the game. We love the kids. And uh, and uh, it's nice. It's This was a test because last night was our first COVID night of basketball. So, like, all the kids had to wear a mask. We had to limit it to families only, media families only, and the parents had to wear a mask. And we're using the school, so we got to follow the school rules. And, you know, knock on wood, it sounds like it went off. You know, I went there in the beginning, got everything set up. And that's what I kept my role as. I'm doing all the administrative stuff. You know, I'm just not being the interface with the parents anymore. And uh, and uh, it's, you know, seemed like it went well. So we'll see. Tonight we have both gyms going tonight. We have Riccardi, and then the older kids start their league in Donovan tonight, my 13-15 program. So Wednesdays are always a busy night, but it's good to get the kids back to doing stuff normal. Yeah. You know, uh, kids need it, you know, and uh, hopefully, you know, it was nice. We started yesterday, and I was following the COVID reports, and it seemed the positivity rate's definitely declining fast. We on the better side of it. On the better side of it, so it kind of made for a good day to start this. Yep. And uh, I just hope, you know, we had one team over the weekend who was supposed to play last night who called us and said they had four kids out with COVID, so they couldn't play. So we had a quick switch to schedule. But... I don't have anybody running leagues. I know a number of the hockey leagues are struggling the same way. And unfortunately, a lot of times it's the same families and same children. Yeah, because they just spread through. One league and are part of a travel team. So whoever gets it, those both of those leagues are impacted. It's not a, it's a difficult challenge. And my biggest concern, I just, I just hope all the parents, you know, we all know that you get some parents who, you know, <laughs> you have to they all have to re- you know i had a parent already call me up after a couple of practices and, and uh, discuss about the kids not wearing a mess properly and i'm like i get it i said but you as a parent the coaches that you guys need to emphasize the kids keep their mask on mm-hmm. i'm not the mask police yeah. i'm not going to be there and walk through this walk through the crowd and make sure everybody has a mask on we're all adults we're all we all need to help each other out i did post signs up all on the, the gym saying you know mask required you know you know you got to trust the people Spectrum of tolerance is so different because you have folks that won't, don't want to wear a mask at all, right? And you're mixing them in a pool where folks that haven't come out of the house well, and wear a mask correctly. We put day. these rules. At, put all that together. It's uh, we put these rules. We, we put these rules out as far as sign up. So we said, if you're going to sign your child up, here are going to be the rules. Accept it, yeah. You know, because you, know, you make them oath that they're not going to yell at each other too, and they'll do that the first. Oh, no, I know, I know, I know. But you know, hopefully, we'll see what happens. You know. The, the bottom line is everybody's got to keep in mind we're doing this for the kids. We want to get the kids out. The kids need exercise. The kids need to be out and intermingling. And well, is that your phone or is that Lawrence cutting us off? You know, Both. you guys ready to take a break and then Anything we'll come back to Chief Tinty? All right. All right, sounds good. Listening to Kingston Community Radio on WGHQ Kingston on your radio at 9:20 a.m. and 92.5 FM, and also online at mykcr.org. Hi, I'm Steve Thomas for Habitat for Humanity Restore. Habitat Restores are nonprofit home improvement stores and donation centers that sell new and gently used furniture, building materials, and appliances to the public at a fraction of the retail cost. The Ulster County Restore at 406 Route 28 in Kingston needs your donations. Call our hotline at 845-853-7499 to schedule your free pickup. And thanks. 
January is National Blood Donor Month, and Dunkin' Donuts and the American Red Cross are teaming up to honor blood donors who make a difference. This is Donna Morrissey of the Red Cross. All those who come in to give blood in the month of January at a Red Cross blood drive will receive a $5 Dunkin' Donuts gift card. It's one way we can say thank you for being a hero to patients in need. Your help is needed now. Please call 1-800-RED-CROSS, visit redcrossblood.org, or download the Blood Donor app to find a blood drive near you. Thank you for making a difference. At St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, we're fighting against childhood cancer every day. At the heart of this battle are our donors. Most of us want to make some type of difference in the lives of others. St. Jude does miraculous work. The fact that no one has to pay, it's a place where everyone is treated as an equal. Everybody is welcome here, and it doesn't matter your religion or what part of the world you're from, all that is taken away. It just gives you some hope. It's just a nice feeling to put your energy into something that really does genuinely make a difference in a child's life. There's just no greater gift. If we have the ability to help, then we have a responsibility to help. Finding cures, saving children. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Find out how you can help at stjude.org. Have you ever experienced a wish come true? For a child battling a critical illness, a wish come true can be a turning point. One song, one dance, one game, one adventure, one moment changes everything. Make-A-Wish needs your support to grant the wish of every eligible child. Visit wish.org now to help grant more life-changing wishes. Together, we can transform lives one wish at a time. Hi, my name is Jackie Lavezzo. I'm from Lake Katrine. And I support the Kingston Community Radio because it is an invaluable resource to the community and its residents. This programming is brought to you by the Friends of Kevin Cahill. As a strong advocate of local broadcasting, Assemblymember Cahill urges you to support Kingston Community Radio with your time and donations. Your contributions keep KCR vital and on the air at FM 92.5, AM 920, and on the web at mykcr.org. Please join Assemblymember Cahill and send your gifts of $10, $25, or more to Kingston Community Radio, Post Office Box 4364, Kingston, New York, 12402. Together, let's keep KCR alive. Nope. We're back. Thanks, Lawrence. We're back. Uh, I'm Fred Costello, the Town of Supervisor. I'm joined this morning by my co-host, Mayor William Murphy of the Village, and we have our first guest. Good morning, Chief. Good morning. Chief Tinty from the Kingston Police Department, who's a regular for our listeners. And uh, always gives us a good half hour, or hour. Whatever you got. I'm Whatever good. Got, yeah. You guys were on a pretty good roll before. I was waiting in the car listening. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, maybe maybe I got the wrong show day. Well, I don't know. In, man. <laughs> That's all Bill and I had. Right? Yeah. I no. now. And I gotta, I'm just going to add this. Listening in, you were talking about the DPW getting out there early. And, um, you know, I know they don't normally, I can speak for Kingston, they don't normally run 24-hour crews, um, like the cops and the firefighters and stuff. But they are absolutely essential. I can't tell you how many times we've called and said, hey, our intersections are slick or, um, you know, we can't. We have all, you know, all-wheel drive vehicles now that we're operating, um, for, obviously, for, for good purpose. And But it's amazing how sometimes it you, you take it for granted, really. Absolutely. You know, people look out the window. They're like, oh, where are they? Where are they? Mm-hmm. You know, and. You know, in Kingston, I you know I can't speak for other jurisdictions, but you know the miles and miles of streets, you know, and and they take it for granted, really. I mean, I I you know I take it, I plow, I have a small, I don't do one commercially or anything, but just my my place, and I can appreciate where do you put this stuff? Where you, <laughs> you, know, yeah. what do you, you get to an intersection, you're like, what? Well, yeah, now what do you do? do now, with it? Yeah. You know? So manhole covers and potholes sometimes. You just no, nah, no, nah, they don't get enough credit. They really don't. You know, I know. There's just, a couple of uh, dense areas of sorghumies in the town. The village obviously is almost entirely dense, but those plow routes generally go to the least senior guys because they can't say no. <laughs> the neighbors there, holy cow! You pushed all the snow in my driveway. What about the other side of the road? I'm like, the truck is thirty five thousand pounds, and they can't see. They, it's not like they're driving their snowblower. 
And, uh, you know, every year, especially if you get some heavy storms, the, the days after to try to oh, yeah. calm everyone down. Well, and and then you have the state, catches. you know, we do our roads, but then the state or county comes through sure. with their intersections, and then yeah, and our guys got to come back out. Back it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean. It's, where do you put it, right? Where do you, especially, you know, two, three inches, you say, okay, it'll yeah. go away. But you get a storm like this where you got six to eight inches in some places more. You know, like I said, in a city environment, you look at like, wow. And, you know, with the new Broadway, um, you know, streetscape, I guess you could say, you know, they have the bike lanes, the parking lanes, the, you know, it's it's a challenge. I, I give them a lot of Just credit. Just now, when I came here and I drove through Uptown, I don't know how they plow in Uptown there. I mean, that's a real difficult area to plow. Because you have just the way the things jet out. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's really, I mean, yeah. wh where do you put anything on? Yeah, everything's curbed. You know, at least in the village, like, on our, we, Main Street's huge. Just, mm -hmm. you know, it's probably twice as, si twice as wide as the roads are here in Uptown, you know. So even when we push this stuff off, there's still plenty of space. But, mm -hmm. I mean, that's really almost one lane. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Parts, and then know. you get the parking issues, right? We're doing alternate side street parking right. and whatnot. But, you know, years and years, many, many years ago, there was, you know, weren't allowed to park on any city streets during a snowstorm. So it was easy. You'd pull up, you'd say, okay, this car's in the way. And DPW would yeah, try to do the right thing. We'd knock on the door, and when the cops showed up and say, hey, is this your car? Is this your car? We'd try to track them down, run the run the, uh, the reg. But in some cases, people just are oblivious to it. And then they complain. Oh, my car was towed. You know, and I, the older I get, the less patience I have with people anymore. I, I'm still able to stay professional, but if they if it was a face-to-face -face phone call, they'd see me shaking the head, and, you know, it just I just can't do it anymore. It's... Uh, because it's well, not one car on the street is a oh, disaster. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's crippling. Well, that power operator yeah. is yeah. nightmare. Well, we have a we have a constant offender that does that. I tell my DPW, plow him the hell. No, out. no, just pile it up. Pile it up. You need a place to put the snow. That's it. Because you know good what? Good for you. They'll learn next time not to leave the car there. Good for, no, they won't. But good for you. Yeah. Oh, I don't care. Because you have I have a few of them, and I'm like, listen, you need a place to put your snow right there. Good for you. You know, I'm. It's because it is. It ruins the whole street, and you're not being fair to their neighbors. They're not. You know. They're not. And in the old days, the neighbor usually. Oh, exactly. Hey, get it well, out of come there. Come on, let's go. Yeah. Clean it. Move the car, right? But well, we, you, don't, we don't have that anymore. Well, you got me one. It was last, no, last year I got a phone call after a snowstorm. And I won't tell the whole story because I don't want to sell the person out. <laughs> but they were complaining that the next morning after a snowstorm, their neighbor's sidewalks weren't shoveled. And I'm like, first of all, it's 24 hours. Right. Second of all, shovel it. Shovel, maybe, help, maybe help them out. Help yeah. them out. Yeah. You know, I said in my old, I said, you know, I got up this morning, my two neighbors were fighting over my driveway. They're snowblowers. They both got new snowblowers. And I'm sitting there going, thanks, guys. Yeah. You know, what happened to the day where you helped your neighbor out exactly. instead of calling the mayor's office to complain about your neighbor? Yeah. Like I was talking earlier, you know, sometimes you get these phone calls like, why are you calling me yeah. about this? Yeah. I mean, I got one, my fear, <laughs> I had to tell this. I got one last year. Guy called me to complain that his neighbor's cat was pooping on his porch. <laughs> what? That's a real story. Yeah. Is there a litter box up there or something? I, he goes, what are you going to do? I said, well, why don't you buy a litter box for it? There you go. He goes, I don't find that very amusing. He just lost the vote. You know that, right? I said, well, what is it you expect me to do about it? Cats are free-roaming animals. You know? It's like. There must have been something appealing to the cat to go, though, because they generally are private. Something's odd. I wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted to say, did you take a DNA test? I love, I love it. That's just <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but it was just, you get, and I, I always joke, I can write a book on some of the calls I get, you know. One, one night, years ago, a lady called me about a skunk in her garbage pail. Called me at home to tell me she had a skunk in her garbage pail. Okay. I got a, I got a possum in my backyard. Who's helping me with that? You know, <laughs> or a woodchuck, I mean to say. Especially in the garden. You come get rid of my woodchuck, I'll get rid of your skunk. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. It's like my wife, my wife will my wife will say to me, she goes, I can't believe people actually call you about stuff like this, and you know, it's it's sometimes it's amusing, and sometimes the people after I talk to them, they're like, yeah, you're right, you know, it's kind of silly, yeah, <laughs> you know, but they should. <laughs> I'm good. It's a small I'm good. town. I'm good. It comes to small town. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they get it, but no that's, uh, it. Yeah. it gives it gives me a lot of good talking points, though. <laughs> One of uh, he's still at the department, this gentleman in uh, the police department, and we get a call. There's a resident with a snake in her basement. Uh, I know. And I'm like, uh, I get that. I'm calling you. Yeah. He's like, oh, I'll go. I don't know if I can catch it, but I'll check it out. He went there, and it was like a three-foot long milk snake, which that's out of my league. <laughs> <laughs> I caught it, let it go out in the backyard. I was like, 
You're a hero, man. <laughs> that was well done. Well, I called your guys. This is probably long ago, six, seven years ago, or eight years ago. I opened my back porch up, and I got it open for the summer. It was like Memorial Day weekend. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, I hear this little rustling up in the eaves. And I have three cats. I'm like, oh, it must be one of my cats climbed up there. So I get up. I look. Thing comes out. It wasn't one of my cats. Oh. No, it wasn't a snake. It was a freaking raccoon. Oh, oh really? I'm like, oh, shit. I'm not touching that thing. No. Like, so I call you guys. Sid comes over. And uh, next thing I know, Sid's up there. Yep, Merv, it's a raccoon. I go, what are you going to do about it? Goes back, comes back, goes out to the car, gets his rifle. I'm like, Sid. <laughs> He goes, what else you want me to do? He's the right guy to do it, though. He knows how to handle himself in the woods. He shot it. Yeah. We, we pulled, pulled the eve out. The thing dropped on the ground. Yeah. The thing was huge. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting there and go. He comes back with the road. He's just like, he's going to use that. I'm like, I'm not getting, I'm not getting the raccoon. Nah, you're in good hands there. He's, uh, he, he tried to handle himself defense, in the He tried to get it first with gloves. He's like, that thing's a beast. <laughs> yeah. no, you don't want to get hurt. Yeah. Except a cat door. It must have came in through my cat door and during the winter it. and nested up in the porch for the winter. You can't keep that. Nah, they're just trying to find shelter, right? I, I still have spots of blood on my eaves. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, I go, Sid, you're taking that with you, aren't you? He goes, so what do you want me? I'm going to take it. All right, Merv, I'll take it for you. I'll take it to the dump. <laughs> and he shoveled Perfect. it up, put it in a bag, and took it. Perfect. But again, that's I don't do that usually. And that's usually. the beauty of small town. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because Absolutely. in a big city, someone went, a police officer probably wouldn't do that for you, you know? I call animal control, right? Yeah. 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 You know. Call somebody in D.C. or somebody that can yeah. re- refer it. But, our, you know, our guys handle the snakes, the bats, you know, <sighs> stuff like that. Where something they can handle. And, and it depends on the officer. Some officers are definitely afraid no. of snakes. They're like, there's no way, no how. Unless you want bullet holes in your wall, there's no way I'm I'm taking a snake out of your house. Oh. There's others that, like you said, they step on a tail, grab it, ah, oh, it's just a oh. snake, and then throw it outside. Didn't phase you know? him a yeah. bit. Curled yeah. up around his arm real tight, and he's like, see it? I'm like, yeah, I see I, it. I would have been, been dead. <laughs> I was uncomfortable. I was 10 feet away from him. I, I had a gardener stuck in my basement one time about three feet long. And I had to go down to the basement to get something. I made my five-year-old daughter go down in front of me and shield me to get what I needed <laughs> in the basement. Because she wasn't afraid of it. I, I was definitely afraid of it. And I called. I had to call someone to come get a garden snake out of my basement. I said, I don't care. I'll pay you as much as it takes. Come get this. He spent an hour in my basement trying to catch the snake because I was hiding. And he finally caught it. And I think it cost me 50 bucks to get rid of the snake that day in my basement. I was uh, terrified. You know who's not afraid of snakes at all? My sister-in-law, Mary Lynn. I can see that. She's, I know, but it's like... <laughs> She's tough. She's, she's tough, but yeah. she's, you know, when you look at her, she's a tall, beautiful, feminine young lady, and if there's a snake around, she's already catching it. Ugh, those, those are my biggest phobias in yeah. life are snakes. Yeah, no fear I don't like worms. I can't fish. I don't like worms. Anything slimy like that. So here's the, uh, this is the, this was August, so we're cleaning up around the, the top of the, one of the big oh. holes in the back. Mm. So it's about a four and a half foot black snake, and my wife is, again, just like you said, just Burn the place down. Yep. Wants nothing to do with them. Sell the house. And I said to him, "Come on." And I'm one of those guys. I was, you know, in the country, and so I just go. I had the glove on. I just kind of grab it, and she's like, Yo, "What if it bites you?" I'm like, "The head of it is this big. <laughs> it's not like it's got fangs. It's a little black snake. Leave it alone, you know." And but yeah, they wrap around your arm. But what's weird for me is, especially with the, it's it's cold, right? From an animal, a breathing, you you feel really? it warm. It. It's, oh, no, you've never. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 yeah. I don't point on any chief. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. When we first bought the property, well, now we've had it for six years, it was overrun with field mice and black snake. Black snakes, big, yeah. Big, big black snakes. And uh, now that, you know, between our dogs and animals and chickens and sheep and everything else we got going on, they're all up in the back, way back in the field. So yeah, occasionally but... you'll come across one, but it's not common anymore they don't come down to the house so the old wife's tale though is if you have black snakes you won't have copperheads so black snakes like that's them. why i try i'm telling you right now it would i, I hate to kill any animal i really i'm, I'm at that point in my life where so but my wife will have no trouble killing this thing with a shovel like if i see her walking around with a square shovel i know there's a snake around somewhere <laughs> and um so i'll try to get there first but yeah there's been occasion where you know they they, they we had, when we first bought the property, we did a lot of cleanup, and they would get themselves into these logs and kind of curl up in there. And at one point, so I'm cutting the tree up and a big, good-sized log, and I go to pick it up, and I turn, and I see something move in the log out of the corner. <laughs> uh, you're getting a little, oh, a little, a little white. And um, so I drop the log, and I look, and it's a black snake, and it, it was a good-sized thick. And I'm like, oh, man, that's so cool. So I picked up another one and put it over the top just to hold it there. So... Uh, Oh, you, I, didn't, you didn't get you didn't get your wife on this, did you? No, no, no. So my uh, my stepson comes <laughs> up, and he, at the time, <laughs> Turner, Turner was like eight years old, and he comes up and he's like, "Hey, Jiddy, what are you doing?" And he kind of 
puts his arm up on the second log, and I go, hey, bro, I said, there's a, there's a black snake in there. What? I go, yeah, show it to me. So I moved the log out, and you could see it, the tongue's going out. He goes, oh, that's so cool. So I'm like, all right, don't listen. Don't tell mom, <laughs> which he must have heard tell screaming mom. to mom. So he's screaming, mom, mom, shit, has got a black snake. So then there was the debate. Kill it. I said, like, I'm not killing it. I refuse to kill it. It's harmless. It's good for yep. keeping the mice down, no copperheads, nothing like that. Back and forth, I said, I'm going to move it to the back, but I'm not killing the snake. I just, I'm not doing it. So it gets dark. I said, you know what, I'll leave it. I'll do it first thing in the morning when I take care of the animals. I go back up there. I take the log out. I look inside. There must have been a little bit of hole. On its way out. And it went back out. And so... <laughs> So she says to me, she's probably listening. Um, you tear yourself in right did now. You t- did you take the snake to the back? Oh, yeah, yeah, way to the back. Yeah, it's never gone. Seen it oh, again. no, you'll never, that's right. You'll yeah. never see that snake again. But, uh, <laughs> no, when, uh, but yeah, so it's. Uh, I don't like killing them either. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a fan of killing them. Right. I just, that's why I always tell, I live in a village. I will never move to Blue Mountain or West Surrogates because yeah, I'm, ca- you don't get too many snakes in the village, knock on wood. Right. You know, at least if I do, I get gardener snakes. I might get them from the, from the Surrogate kill from hits, but. We yeah. had one, uh, it's a police response. We had one at uh, Dallas Hot Wieners on Broadway. There's a little corner store. Now they did, uh, re- they redid the streetscape there. And uh, there were patrons inside. And a snake just showed up, must have come from a car or a truck that went in to get hot dogs. And it showed up on the sidewalk and it was like hitting the glass. Oh, my God. So, no, you know, people <laughs> were like inside. Out. They call the cops. And so our first officer up, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. They don't teach us this in the academy. And uh, But the second one showed up and he was like, ah, oh, it's just a black snake. And kind of went up there and it, he, he managed to get it towards the patrol car. And then it went up in the fender, in the wheel well. So he had to reach up in there and grab it by the head and pull it out. And then he. Grab the bag, put it in the bag, and they took it out. Took it, away, the took it to the woods. So, but, uh, yeah, the first one's like, no, oh, no, 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 no. But uh, all the peaches were up against the glass. And, sure, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. It's a hostage situation because you're in yeah. for a black snake. The and again, uh, you know, a little black snake, a little head on, it's this big. You know, it's got little teeth for eating critters, you know. so It's just something about snakes, I think. And generally, people are afraid of them. It's their Catholic upbringing. Yeah, I guess, maybe. Messed up the whole garden eating thing. Oh, uh, yeah, man. That, it could be. Yeah. I don't get where people have them as pets. That, yeah, that's all. a little weird. So my wife it. just texted me. I thought you stole me. You <laughs> killed it. <laughs> Sorry, honey. <laughs> you're, buying, yeah. you're buying dinner tonight. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening, Lee. <laughs> yeah. We appreciate you yeah. listening. No, it's uh, it's just different, right? But, you know, getting back to the, the DPW part of it, I, I got to tell you that, you know, these guys going out at 2 o'clock in the morning, and, and you're right. You know, I can imagine that they complain – Get complaints. They're starting too early. They're starting too late. They're, st- they're not getting to my place. I had somebody call the other day, really a friend of mine, and say something like, well, I don't understand, you know, and because I have a big tractor with a plow on it and stuff. And he's like, yeah, you know, you plow your driveway. I need something that size. I go, you know, for your driveway? I said, no. He goes, well, my tractor couldn't handle it. I said, well, then don't wait for 12 inches of snow. Yeah. Go out there when there's six, I said, so your tractor can handle it. Come on. You know, that's you got to be reasonable about it. He didn't like that. I haven't spoken to him since. So whatever. <laughs> One less friend coming to dinner. <laughs> that's how I love my neighbors. You know, and I made. I told somebody the other day, like you like. I'm like during the summer when I mow my lawn. I usually hit one or two of my neighbors' front lawns, and they have snowblowers. So then the deal is the winter. Nice. I have new neighbors who I broke in this summer. Yeah. Very nice people, and right away, like when I mow my front lawn, I'm I'm a little anal. So like, and I'm like. If you guys don't, uh, one day I said, uh, you know, they're away. I said, I'll mow the one that came. Oh, you mow? I'm like, yeah, I don't mind. Oh, if you want to mow the front one for it, you can any time. We hate. I said, no problem. <laughs> and then they told me they got a snowblower. They said, who, who snow? Uh, I'm like, well, I guess you are, you know. Yeah. And and Miss Bob Wallace across the street always. Does. So yesterday, Bob, my new neighbor and Bob Wallace were both out there with snowblowers on Monday doing my drive. I'm Perfect. Like, this is great. <laughs> Your hands make it easy, you know. And then I got, you know, when they got done, I had to go out and clean the cars off. But I just, you know. I don't. I hate shoveling snow, and I'm like, yeah. I was gonna buy a snowblower, and then I got Bruce Jargis who has to plow on his tractor. So between the three of them, they do. You know, we only have seven houses. Any, yeah. yeah, they. You know, we have a neighborhood where everybody takes care of everybody. It's old school. There's a couple of places in Kingston that are just like that. You know, two or three on the snowblower, yeah. two or three walking yeah. around with shovels. They clear the car with the brooms. It really is a, a neighborhood. You know, yes. people know everybody. They're well. You know, in fact, my son just moved to to a neighborhood in there with his girlfriend, and great place. You know, and right away they're like. You know, looking around, What's, uh, who's that over there, you know? So they came over, and I said, oh, that's my, my kid. Oh, okay, good, 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 good. You got to introduce himself. And so I said to him, listen, this isn't, you got to be part of this, I said. it's These are rare situations mm-hmm. anymore, you know? You gotta, yeah, they are. got to appreciate it, yeah. you know? Help help each other out. You yep. got done shoveling, and you see your neighbor's still out there. Go over there and shovel, you know? Yep. So. 
Oh, I, I got the same thing when I bought my house. It's seven houses on a cul-de-sac, and I mean, you know, I've had a few people change over the years, but it's yeah, it's a neighborhood. Yeah. And, you know, I do the stuff during the summer. Me and one guy at the end of the road, Mike, we're the ones that like to do the mowing. And, you know, and we'll mow the entrance to the cul-de-sac with our tractors. We'll go down there and keep that area clean. We'll help each other. He does the one neighbor's front lawn. I do the other neighbor's front lawn. And, you know, it's, it's again, that's the way it should be, you know. Yeah. Yep. And then we'll make fun of Bob when he's out doing his lawn because Bob's a retired teacher. And, you know, you know we all know Bob Wallace. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Bob's out there to push mower sweating and... Uh, <laughs> You know, best neighbor in the world. We just, you know. Get an exercise. Get an exercise. Get an exercise. I'm like, Bob, I'll come help you, but I'm, I think your wife wants you to get the exercise, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and I got Bruce Sargas on. You know, we all, it, it's neat. We all just, like you said, everybody has a role in the neighborhood and how they help each other out, you know, and it's cool, you know. It's, it's unfortunate it doesn't exist, I'm, even on a smaller level, you know, just knowing each other, yeah. you know. There's, you know. Neighbors not be neighborly, right? I, I use that term all the time, but it's it's unfortunate where people will move in and now there's a noise complaint, right? Yep. Music, it's too loud. Again, old days. Yeah. Hey, bro, could you tell your kid to not, you know, you lower it down a little bit? Just look. Nope, they call the police, call the right? Police. And now, yep. now you got a uniform cop there, which is not always popular in certain neighborhoods, and you, you go, hey, your music's too loud. Who says yeah. Who says my music's too loud? It's crazy. And you look over, you know, and then they're like, you know, which one of the neighbors? I'm going to turn it up more now. No. I, I, it's just, now, next thing you know, they're throwing stuff over the fence. And I had a guy, again, we could probably tell stories on it all day long, but guy called me up. He said, oh, I got a problem with the neighbor and there's a fence. And I'm like, okay, listen to me. The building department's already involved. You've already explained to me the situation. In 26 days, they have to remedy that situation by everything you've described to me. Yeah. For 26 days... I don't want you to have any contact. Now, I'm talking to this guy, an adult, like a child. Sir, please understand, for 26 days, you should not have any eye contact. Eye contact, anything. Do not. In fact, stay away from the fence. Stay away from the neighbor. Just let it play out. That afternoon, I hear on the radio, uh, headquarters uh, to a dispatch, uh, car 110. Could you respond? I'm like this. I listen to the address. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. They ended up arresting him for something and because he couldn't stay on his side of the fence. Let the let the process play out, right? You may not like it, and it may be the longest 20-some days that you got to wait. Let it play out. But he couldn't do it. Now he's got to go to court. So. Oh, you know, I, and I tell people all the time, I mean, I'll get people call and complain about their neighbors. I'm like, did you talk to them? Did you talk to them? Yeah. yeah. And because I found out early in my days as being mayor, a few times I tried to mediate. And guess what? At the end, they both end up piss, being pissed off at me. <laughs> yeah. So anymore, I'm like, that's a neighbor problem. Hire a lawyer. I said, yep. and, I'll, and I'll say something. I said, you know, like, and I don't want to, like, I have a neighbor who I love, great people. They don't keep their backyard as nice as I like to keep my backyard. And, but it's fine. New York's fenced in. They're great neighbors. And I, you know, someone who goes to me, he goes, why do you put up with that? I said, well, why wouldn't I? They're like, well, you got to look at it. I said, well, no, I got a fence there. And I said, and it's not messy. They, just keep, they store a lot of stuff in their backyard. And I'm like, but they're nice neighbors. I said, pick your battles. Mm-hmm. Would you rather have a jerk as a neighbor who's exactly. meticulous yeah. or somebody maybe who's not as, keep their yard as not, not as neat as you do, but they're great neighbors? Yeah. I said, take the good with the bad, you know? I mean, yeah. you know, big deal. Grass clippings. Yeah. So, again, completely unknown to me. I was, you know. Raised in the country, we measure land in acres. That's how we measure land, not city lots or villages. Acres, right? So, but there were people uptown many years ago fighting over two inches on a survey. Two inches. This guy was mowing it, then he'd mow it the week later, and then, and it just became, it started to escalate. And I just could not understand two inches. Now, at one point, the guy's cutting the grass with a push mower. And the shoot is pointed, so the grass clippings of this guy's 22-inch mower is getting pushed Mark, onto this the guy. other side. End of the world. It's unbelievable, yeah. right? <laughs> We're talking about crime and robberies and stuff like that in certain sections. This is what you have to argue with? Mm-hmm. So then the next thing you know, it started to escalate. Somebody put a camera up. Oh, it's pointing in my garage. I don't want him looking at my wife. I got a problem with my kid. I got this. Holy cow. The fence, he measured the fence now at six foot one. City co- city regulations say six feet. Yep. It's unbelievable. And he just, again, because he built an apartment, yeah, it's six foot one. Guy just took it. a circular saw and cut one inch right off the top of the fence. Like, <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> I love when I get an email and they send me the law in the email. Now, this guy's violent, like, same thing with fence law. Well, isn't this your code? Yeah. Again, go talk to your neighbor. Say, hey, you know. 
have you have you tried discuss it with, discussing yeah. it with them? Just work it out, right? You're there for in many cases years, right? Years. Your kids go to the same school, just. I mean, uh, I grew up. My neighborhood. I grew up in the same thing. I mean, you know, it was a fight to see who would do whose sidewalks when it snowed, and who would do each other's driveway and everything. I mean, you looked out for each other's kids, yeah. each other's pets. Yeah. You know, and nowadays everybody's. It's all about me. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, it's it's a shame. It's 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 not like it used to be by any means. Yeah. One of the things we adopted last year was a property maintenance law, yeah. which we did not have, and you do have. We've had a long time, yeah. Village and uh, and that's we, the motivate. Uh, it covers what like how high you grass can be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We didn't change any of the state standards. Okay. Whatever the state standards for property maintenance are, we adopted those okay. straight out. We didn't want to invent the wheel or anything like that. And uh, so we implemented this law because in Sorgues we only had. The neighbors try to talk. They can't work it out. The building inspector goes, identifies a violation, and then you write the 30-day order to remedy. Yep. But if they don't comply, you're right. in court. There's right. no mechanism right. in between. How do you get it? Yep. So we developed this property maintenance law in hopes of creating that mechanism in between and expanding the toolbox available to the building department. And in some cases, it's things where the if the town board had the authority, they could address it. We had a house burn out that was not... Uh, the owners walked away. The mortgage company didn't want to foreclose. Now you have this unsafe structure, and nobody has authority to f put boards on the windows. Right. Obvious problem needed to be addressed. So the property maintenance law will give us that mechanism, and hopefully we can get to a little bit better situation. Uh, we had, you'll appreciate this, Chief. There was a resident lives in a very nice neighborhood, and there's a legacy apartment building in that neighborhood that came before all the nice homes mm -hmm. and this apartment isn't exactly maintained well and over the past two years the tenants did not pay their rent so this landlord is totally frustrated he can't collect rent can't do what he wants to do so he stopped the carting service well oh. as punishment to yeah so now the dumpster's overflowing and it's blowing into all these neighbors yards and the one neighbor he keeps his yard nice yep. and is pretty aggressive about his response. And I'm like, listen, you have to stay in your lane. I get it. This is a problem. But with the property maintenance law now, the town could actually invoke, yep. restore the carding service. Okay. It'll create a cost for the landlord, but they're obligated anyway. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so hopefully this will mitigate some of those really well, obvious bad ones. We even have that in actual property maintenance. Like if the lawn's not upkept, yep. we will hire a service or my DPW will do it. And then we put the bill, we yeah. bill it under taxes. Yeah. Because you know what? <laughs> or we, and we do it for snow removal on sidewalks. Yeah, same thing here. Yeah. Because you know what? The first time they get a bill for $100 for a sidewalk being shoveled, they're going to find Johnny down the street. He'll do it for 10 bucks. 30 bucks. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. 30 bucks today. Yeah. I know. But, and it's not to be heavy handed. Just sometimes... You know, we're all pointed to, and we all can share stories about neighbors being good neighbors, but we also have a lot of stories where neighbors are not. Yeah. And, uh, you know, court's not always the answer. We actually sent the guy to jail for property maintenance violations where they were having uh, car fluids, yeah. antifreeze, and wow. bad stuff leaking onto the other neighbor's property. Yep. That's a catastrophe. I have that right now. It's actually, have it right now. He's got his third court appearance next week. And it's, of course, it's not the perfect mechanism to fix it. It's not, unfortunately. And But the thing is, legally, like for that, like this has to do with cars on properties. Yeah. We can't legally go in and remove those vehicles. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know. Yeah. So, you know, we had to take them to court. And I feel bad for the neighbors. They've been patient through it. But, I mean, they're tired of looking out their window and seeing car parts all over this guy's backyard. He's turning into a junkyard. And, you know, village law prohibits that. Yeah. But we can't just go in and remove the stuff. Now, if the house is abandoned, I would do it. And I've done it before for abandoned houses. We've gone in and just cleaned up and, you know, listen. Eat it. They want to sue me. Yeah, yeah, we'll eat it or whatever. They want. To, or even like recently we did one and actually the house is going up for taxes. So we add to the tax bill. So when someone buys that property off taxes, they're going to assume that, that cleanup debt. And uh, But sometimes, you know, sometimes we just do it if it's the right thing to do. But, you know, if there's someone's living in a house, I'm not going to put my building inspector at risk saying go into the backyard and because it's, it's a balancing act. Yeah. And Fred, you got any it. birthdays there? Yeah, we do have some do birthdays. We? Do you? Are we, doing, are we doing a break? I don't think... Uh, check. I don't I think, think there are any birthdays. birthdays. No birthdays. Oh, there you go. For, don't worry about the announcements. Okay. Yeah, we don't have a birthday. Then, 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 then carry on. Boys, Dairy Milk House. Uh, We're our rolling sponsor. today. I guess someone's not getting a cake He's today. going to have extra cake <laughs> this week. We're rolling I today. I feel bad. I have a couple friends who have birthdays. Ah, you could have submitted their names. You could have been eating cakes. January 19th. Yeah. Ralph El Grimaldi? Yeah. Is he? It's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Ralph. January, baby. Oh, Ralphie. We had Mr. Wells yesterday, my sister. Mine's coming up. I got none. 
I don't mean January birthdays. No? A couple anniversaries, I think. My brothers, both my older brothers. I think. It's a pretty good month for Keek in our family. We just had, well, I can celebrate my DPW, or my water, wastewater supervisor, Mike Hoff, turned 50 last Tuesday. Oh, wow. Yep, big 5 out. That's a good one. Yeah. Feels yeah, just like, like 49. We're all, we're all 19. Uh, yes. God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When I don't have this on, I'm a ch- my wife accuses me of being a, you're a child. Yes, yes, I am. I am. I am a child. You can hang on to that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My, do- my daughters do the same thing to me, you know, though. Like, listen, you, what kind of father do you want? Exactly. <laughs> want an old grumpy father? He's exactly right. My, I had a grumpy father. <laughs> my father was 50 when he was 30. It was just, it wasn't fun. I'm, I consider myself, well, maybe ridiculously fun sometimes. But, yeah, uh, yeah I say and do stuff. And We had this family prank that my brother-in-law started, and it's called Smack Ass. You know, and he started with my, our, my kids. He has two daughters, same age as my two daughters. So, I mean, literally, my daughters, walk when they're home, walk around the house the whole time like this. <laughs> they did themselves? They won't pass me. <laughs> you know? and they give it right back but you know every once in a while i catch them sleeping you know <laughs> but yeah i mean that's you gotta have fun yeah. you know i mean it, it's funny like my wife and i like i always joke my wife and i have never had a fight in 25 years seriously i, I married the most incredible girl ever and I'm, i mean that sincerely we just have fun and every once in a while though we you know, we'll jab at each other, but it's not a fight by any yeah, means. Yeah. It's like, you know, she'll be like, Bill, can you wipe your face? You got mustard. I'm saving it for later. Leave me alone, you know? <laughs> and my daughter's will go, would you guys stop it? I'm like, you think that's fighting? That's fighting. Mm-hmm. You should have grown up in the Irish household I grew up in. I had the best parents in the world, but when they fought, you knew they were fighting. You right? <laughs> my brother and I would be laying in bed. Okay, mom and dad get divorced. Who are you going to go with? <laughs> you know, and... Uh, I'm like, you don't know what fighting between parents is because you've never seen your mother and I fight because we don't fight. And, but, uh, you know, complaining about the muscle on my face is not a fight. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but we kind of like really go, you know, like we bust each other's chops about it right. like for like five minutes. And, you know, and they're like, oh, you guys stop. And I'm like, really? I said, you should be so, every kid should be so lucky to have parents like you guys have. You know, every, every meal at our house is entertainment. Yeah. So I'll share this with you guys since I don't know if we're going on break or not. But uh, right, I'm so He's letting us run. We had something happen. It was really nothing, but uh, in case you guys come across it, you may have already heard about it. We I put it out to other law enforcement, so they may have shared it. But um, what's going around now is uh, YouTube uh, producers, whatever the content guys, they're going around. They call themselves first the Constitution or First Amendment uh, auditors, and what they do is they come in. Filming, mm-hmm. recording rather, um, into public places, uh, mostly government facilities. So, you know, Village Hall, yeah. they'll come in under the guise of filing a FOIL request or um, looking at the budget or something like that. And, um, you know, people get get some nerving sometimes. You know, somebody walks up to you and says, hey, uh, I'd like to, what do you do here? and What's your name? You know, and when you look at it, it's interesting how different jurisdictions react, right? Mm-hmm. So we had one individual show up. Um, it looks like he came out of New York City. And they travel all over, uh, you know, obviously the, for the content. But um, And what they're doing is monetizing it, right? With YouTube, the clicks, the, the links, uh, the subscribes, sure. all that stuff. Make money for them. But um, it's the first time we, we've seen anything like that around here. So when somebody came in the city hall and was doing this, um, you know, oh, what do you do here? Oh, okay, this is the, the planning office. Okay, well, what's that mean? And, you know, people are like, are you, are you recording? Like, what are you, what are you doing, you know? And so it creates some angst, obviously, mm-hmm. that, so they end up, you know, what they're trying to do really is get the cops there, right? They're not breaking a law. They know what line to, they know the line. They're not going to cross it. But there isn't anything prohibiting unless there is, right? If there's a sign that says no recording beyond this point, no public access, and then it's different, and they never cross that, all right? If they get to the door and it says no recording, they're not going in. They're not making a channel or a you know YouTube video about that, what they're looking for. So it's interesting to see how different jurisdictions and in the employees within those jurisdictions react. Like, you know, they'll go into, you know, I imagine the, the village and the town are open, right? You can walk in and there's a sign that says, you know, town clerk or assessor mm-hmm. yep. or whatever it might be. Um, but there's nothing stopping somebody from walking in like this. So when they walk up to the thing and the clerk says, can I help you? And I says, yeah, I'd like to file a FOIL request to copy the, the salaries and the names of all the employees. And, and I'm just kind of repeating what they do. And sometimes like, well, are you recording me? I, I don't want to be recorded. And I'm like, oh, okay, I understand. Uh, why are you recording us? Well, because I can and I'm doing a story. And 
could you give me the FOIL request? You know, I'm going to fill it out. And But people just, you know, and it's weird, right? Because from the cop's perspective, we always think, like, this guy's planning something, right? He's, he's looking at, he's trying to test the fence. Where are the weak spots in security? And how fast is security going to get there? And so, but that is common. So we had a, an individual come up from, uh, like I said, apparently from New York City, um, and then go to a different place. And sometimes they'll stop at post offices because they're, they're public. Yep. Uh, they'll stop at village, town halls. Um, they focus on the cops traditionally because that's where they get the rise, right? They, again, what they're looking for is that content. So some jurisdictions, you know, no problem. Uh, yeah, no, you can film. No problem. We got body cameras. You got cameras. What are you doing here? You know, and they never give them their name. You know, what's your name? Uh, good guy, uh, free citizen, you know, whatever. And there's no obligation to identify themselves because they're not breaking the law. They're not suspected of breaking the law. So, you know, they know the limit. Um, but for the employees, there was one that I watched. And again, it started to intrigue me like, oh, that's weird. And Clearly, they have a purpose. You know, you and I would look and go, oh, man, what are they doing? Like, I get it, right? They're allowed to do it, but why would they be doing it, right? But they're making money. Right. That's what they're doing. They're making money. This is their way to convert content into cash. Um, but we got to try that. <laughs> <laughs> but some places, you know, they pull the panic alarm. In one of them, uh, there was a, I think, building department or something came out, and the guy goes, what do you... You know, you're making people nervous. What are you doing? Oh, I'm not making people do anything. I'm I'm here to file a FOIL request. And and the guy goes, okay, if you're walking around with a camera, it's not. He goes, well, I can. He goes, you can. It's just making people nervous. And so it's interesting to see how the dialogues take place. And in some jurisdictions, the cops clearly overreact. Like it, it is just, you know, down south there was one down in Georgia, oh, South okay. Carolina, and they're like, get out. And he's like, well, I'm, I'm legally, you can't force me out. I'm not trespassing, and I'm here to file a complaint. Or I'm, And they're like, yep, get out. <laughs> you know, like, and at that point, you're like, oh, the guy realizes, oh, you know what, maybe I'm in the wrong jurisdiction yeah. for this. And, and sometimes they arrest him. Mm -hmm. It's borderline, right? Yeah. It's disorderly conduct, trespass. Sure. And, but in places where he's not allowed to, I'd say he, but there's a couple of them that do this. Um, when the sign says no video, that's it. They're done. No authorized personnel beyond this point. They, But let's face it, right? You look out your window and you see some guy walking around your parking lot looking into the cars. Mm -hmm. You're going to be, uh, hey, what that's do you... Not what, normal behavior. It's not normal. It's yeah. unusual. I think yeah, that's, uh, that's the word I kept using. It's unusual behavior, right? Absolutely, yeah. But there's nothing illegal about it. Understood. But it's right? going to not pulling suspicious. door handles. Especially nowadays, we tell people when you see... What if you, if, and so that's what they're hoping for. Yeah. They're hoping that, so if you see somebody walking around the neighborhood, now, and I extend that to the people listening and watching, because if they, you see somebody on the sidewalk doing this, and they're taping your house, right? You're, video, you're recording your house. That's public space, right? If they zoom into your bedroom window, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. But if they're just walking around the neighborhood doing one of these, and, they, and then you come out and go, hey, hey can I help you? No. Well, what are you doing? I'm just walking the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, are you recording us? Um, yeah, I'm actually recording, uh, but all right, thank you. Uh, wait, whoa, 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 where are you going? Like, I'm not going anywhere. You know, I, I didn't ask for your help. I didn't ask to talk to you. You approach me, you know, and so it's interesting the take on it, but I say that because it seems to be gaining popularity. You know, for years, uh, we were, as law enforcement, we were dealing with swatting. They called it swatting, where uh, people through Xbox or, you know, burner phones, whatever, would call, oh, my God, he's got a hostage, you're going to kill, and hang up. And then, essentially, the police department would send everybody, right, negotiator, SWAT team, and, you know, and we'd have to deal with that from time to time. Um, but now this is kind of like a lesser part of it. So one of the things that, you know, I'm recommending, and, and we have a meeting uh, coming up about security at government buildings, um, you know, really for more of the employees, right? You, they check, they do lockdown drills and uh, lock in place at the schools. You know, what do we do for, for facilities? Are you able to, and even not this, right? This is clearly a person who does not have any ill intent, just trying to get people. Yeah, they're getting you know, contact. It's the content, yeah, right? That's what, rise out of you, right? That's what they're trying to do, right? And in most cases, like I said, you look outside your window and you see somebody in the parking lot, which is, open public space unless there's signs. Employee parking only, you know, public not allowed, but the guy's on the sidewalk now, and that's what he did. He saw the sign, uh, 
you know, employee parking only. And then he went in there and he's looking at the cars and the mayor of this place comes out and he looks and can I help you? And he goes up, uh, no. <laughs> you know, and the mayor's like, okay, what are you doing? He goes, uh, well, who are you? And he says, I'm the mayor. And he goes, Mayor what? He says, Mayor John. And uh, hey, nice to meet you, Mayor John. Thanks for coming out. You know, and, and again, trying to get their eyes. He goes, yeah, I, I really don't feel comfortable with you video, you know, recording our employees. He's like, okay, well, it's public space. I'm allowed to do it. Well, we'll see what the cops say. And the guy's like, no, okay, call the cops. Maybe now he's knows within his rights, right? Yeah. The cops show up, and they look, and they go, hey, how you doing? He's good. He goes, uh, can I help you? And again, the whole conversation, all you're laughing. You're like, the cops are doing what they're supposed to do. He's, well, what's your name? I don't, I don't have to tell you. Okay, but I'd like to know who you're talking about. Well, all right, the cops are doing the same thing, de-escalate the whole. Guy goes, yeah, okay. He's been down, he's been down that street so many times. He knows. He knows, but it is unsettling. People don't like it, right? You get to the window, and there's the guy filling out the request, and he's handing it to the clerk, and the clerk's looking, and I really don't want to be on camera. Okay, well, you're a public employee. And well, this is my office. I mean, I don't, you know, for a FOIA request, they have to get their name. Okay. And in my office, I don't. Do you, do you check ID? For a FOIA request, yes. Oh, you do. Okay. Is that your policy? Because yeah. as long as it's policy, you're good. Yeah. yeah. Can't just do it because you I, just can't do it. And say I need a name. But, Guy goes, yeah. but my my unwritten policy in the office, and I stick to it. If someone comes in to file just a general complaint yeah. and they don't leave their name, I'll let them fill the complaint form out, and then I crumple it up and it goes okay. in the garbage. All right. Because I will not honor an anonymous complaint okay. in my office. See, that's that used to be the policy in Kingston. Now we take anonymous. I see anonymous complaints. Uh, you know, law enforcement really is the one that kind of changed all this, right? So before the complaint, I say the complaint of the complaint process was that I have to come down to headquarters to file a complaint against an officer, right? The officer appears rude during a traffic stop. The person didn't like it. I want to come down. The person gets down to the lobby window, and it's the cop they want to complain about sitting there. Yeah, can I help you? Uh, <laughs> you know, now there's this, or even if it's a sergeant, right? And the cop walks behind the sergeant. I was like, I want to complain against that guy right there. So the body cam, certainly transparency and accountability is one thing. But so the our police commission, civilian police commission said, well, listen, you know, if it's an anonymous complaint, we still have an obligation to look into it. So no different than an anonymous tip. Hey, listen, I, I got a guy on the street dealing drugs. You guys need to check it out. How is that any different than I think Tinty's dirty. You better check him out. Right. So well, an anonymous. T yeah, I guess. If it's a legal matter, I'll, we'll take anonymous complaint. Okay. But, I mean, if a guy comes in and complains about his neighbor's backyard. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. What that's what I mean. Right. I won't, you know. If you're going to complain about your neighbor, put your name behind it. But, no, I'll take, right. if it's if it's obviously a, le a legal situation, yes, I we will take anonymous. That's I, There's a difference there, yeah. So, if this guy comes in, has an interaction with the cops in some of these videos, the cops are, you know, less than professional in some cases. And, you know, in one case, the guy grabbed them. He says, no, nope, we're out. Come on, let's go. And he's like, you're touching me? You have no right to touch me. I'm not under arrest. So he goes right to the town. I want to file a complaint, formal complaint against this police officer. And, you know, at the time, I think city manager was like, um, okay, but, you know, really, he's trying to diffuse it, right? You can see he's doing a good job of it. But the guy goes, yeah, I understand. All right, could you could you give me the complaint form, please? You know, and, and every cop that shows up, he's always asking name and badge number. And some cops are like, uh, Tinty, one, two, four. And other cops are, right, it's right here. You want to see it? Right, there it is. You know, like there's that issue, right? And so I think it's important at least to cover with employees that they may that might happen, or at least review the policies. And I'm not listen. I'm not telling you guys what to do. I'm just saying that this has affected Kingston, and to review policy to be able to say, you know, you, none of your employees can stop someone from recording within the public space that they occupy, the sidewalk, town hall, village hall, city hall. If it's public space, unless there's signs posted, right? No recording beyond this point, right? Because if you say, oh, the common theme is, uh, do you have official business here? I do. Okay, what department are you looking for? Uh, I'm not really sure I need to share that with you. When I get there, I'll, I'll let you know, right? But there's nothing preventing him from going into the bathrooms, going into the area, right? The bathrooms are one thing, clearly, because there's privacy concerns with it, but you know, that video content that he has is, you know, he goes up to the display window, the history of city, and he's looking at it. Oh, oh look at that, you know. And so it's interesting to, the take on that. And I haven't seen anything yet where they do it 
against members of the public. Like, you know, people that, are, that conduct themselves that are citizens, residents, does, he doesn't interact with anybody. It's when they approach him. You know, the one girl uh, on the video clearly had an issue with being on the, the recording, on the, the camera phone, and approached him and said, I, I don't want you recording me. He's like, okay, Just turn that thing off. And she's, he's like, I, I didn't approach you. I'm not taping you. I don't, you know, calm down. This is ridiculous. And she starts losing her mind. And now somebody behind the desk calls the cops. The cops show up. And the cops are like, he, he, you know, ma'am, you're in public. Mm -hmm. You have no right to expectation of privacy in public. Nothing at all. Like, you know, the, the obligation, you know, so the concern obviously is now you have papers scattered on your desk and the guy's at the counter like this and now you've got tax records of somebody on there. Well, that's not his obligation to keep that video hidden. It's your obligation to keep that paperwork secure, yeah. right? So just little things like that. And, you know, I can I can see, listen, I, I'll be the first one to tell you, it's uncomfortable, right? When you get there and you're like, what do you got? What do you got going on up there? Like, there's somebody walking around with a camera and a backpack? Like, mm. that's not right, right? So, but they never cross the line. Never. Never yeah, cross the line. Situation. And then I'm thinking about it in the context of we all are obligated to train in workplace violence, yeah. sexual harassment, all of it. Yeah. That just. Different, right? Yeah. Different. Never had it happen. So it's funny because at one point, I, you know, my wife's up there, she's a city clerk. I get the text. I'm at my desk. She sends it, send an officer. That was the text I got, send an officer. So I'm like, oh, I called down. I said, listen, I don't know what they got at City Hall. The panic alarm's not going off. S got a text from her, send the officer. Send the officer. I hear the car get dispatched up there. So I'm like, and she send, you know, guys getting agitated. I'm like, agitated? So I go up there. I get there at the same time the officer does. We walk in, body cam's rolling. And it took me a little while Fair as I'm out. talking to this guy to realize, oh, I know what he's about. I, get, I understand that, right? Harmless, respectful. You know, when I got there, clearly he was respectful. I guess before that, he got agitated because people kept saying, well, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? He's like, I'm, I'm here. I'm allowed to be here, you know? And, but, you know, it's interesting to see the ones that have been doing it for a while. They never break stride. Like they are, you know, people are starting to scream at them and they're like, sir, 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 calm down. I'm not doing anything wrong. This is not illegal behavior. There's no need to call the police, but if you feel comfortable, do it. Like, and you're like, dang, look at this guy go. All right. You know, but guy walks into the police lobby and starts doing this, right? And again, I don't know everybody's situation as far as how it looks, but just imagine somebody coming in to the village hall. Mm -hmm. How far can they get before they get to a locked door? Is it a hallway? Can they get, you know, is your door open? Because if you your door's open, <laughs> the guy's at the door going, are you the mayor? I see the sign says the mayor. I'm all the way in the back, so I'm yeah. good. No, but but is there anything is preventing fairly... them from getting there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there the is. Village hall oh, there is. Door. Okay, yeah. yes. perfect. We just so, have a foyer, basically, a public foyer. That's okay. all we have. Perfect. Yeah. There's jurisdictions where the one guy was, enti the entire building was like three floors. And he finally got to the door at the top. The door's open. There's no, there's a security guard there. But security guard just, and he went through the magnetometer. He did everything he's supposed to. Clearly, there's no issues with it. And, and he got there, and he's like, oh, this is the mayor's office. He kind of poked his head in. He goes, are you, are you the mayor? He goes, I am. Can I help you? Nope. Thank you. You know, and <laughs> you know, the mayor's like, hey, whoa, 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 where are you going? What, what are you doing? You know, and that created, and then the cops show up, and, you know, the cops, most of them, and I'll say most of them, recognize that it's protected speech, right? Mm -hmm. This, this. He claims it under freedom of press. He's an independent journalist, and that's what these guys do, right? These auditors. But uh, it's interesting to, if you've never had it happen, and you're not aware of it, and your employees aren't aware, you'll get the call. And then what it creates is, well, this time he came with a camera. You know, what happens if, right? Because er there are people out there to complain that, it should be completely publicly accessible, right? We're public, transparency, accountability for all employees, not just cops. Everybody should, I should be able to go in and speak to the town supervisor. I got a problem with that street. I got a problem with the, eh, it's not, there's no guarantee of that, right? Make an appointment. So at what point do we, I'll take City Hall for instance. It's beautiful inside. The marble floors, the walls, the, the amount of money that they put into it in renovation back in 2000, 2001, it was gorgeous, right? T.R. Gallo and amazing place. You have to appreciate chambers, right? The council chambers, it's amazing what mm -hmm. they do. But it doesn't 
feel right when someone's walking around and doing that, right? If there's a meeting going on, it's expected, right? People doing Facebook live stream and stuff like that. Expected behavior. It's kind of unexpected when somebody walks in in the middle of the day. So, I mean, it's all funny games till one of these guys gets shot. Well, right? There, and again, I think, somebody and somebody's like, get out of my office or get out of my building. You know, somebody. And I, again, I think that's why they stay away from going into neighborhoods, right? Because you yeah. get the wrong neighbor. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're, catching yeah. a, you're catching a buttload of buckshot, yeah. <laughs> right? So you got to be careful of that. But like I said, I only mention it because it's something that came up in the city. Um, I did put, uh, I sent to the Cobb Barardi, who's the, the president of the Chiefs Association of Ulster County, and he shared it with the rest of the chiefs. Hey, listen, just keep an eye out for something like this. But, um, again, harmless behavior, but just unsettling to some people, you know, especially ones that don't like to be or have not been accustomed to being on recorded video, you know, so. It's, it's inconsistent with how we try to train employees and staff members to be sensitive to, hey, you know, we could be a target. There could be uh, a family struggling and they're offended by their tax bill. The, the tax collector this time of year takes a lot of abuse. Right. So we're sensitive to, we make sure that, that there's access to law enforcement if needed and that people are, she's never alone and, you know, she's carrying cash. So someone like that would definitely flag on our radar. Why are they here? What are they yeah. doing? Yep. And that's, you know, the building department is not always a hero. They uh, they get drawn into a lot of neighborhoods. Yeah, parking disputes. tickets, right? We Imagine you got to deal with parking oh, tickets. And yep. Obviously. Yeah, those yeah. are the worst, right? Yeah. People, oh, my gosh. You'd rather get a criminal complaint than a parking ticket anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but those things happen. Like the the uh, the uh, controller's office, you get to their door, they're behind glass. Mm -hmm. The doors are locked, you know, clearly because they handle money at times and stuff. But, and we have cameras throughout the building. Everything's it's a secure facility. Again, for a person that did not intend at any point to commit a crime, even in the least, like the trespass, none of it. But they're looking for that content, yeah. that reaction. That's what gets them the money, right? They click, 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 like, 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 like. And... But it, I guess, I guess it, for us, it's more of a training issue. Um, and, and not training, I should correct it. More of an awareness issue. You know, to be able to tell employees, if you get up from your desk and there's a counter there, they are allowed to tape. You can't stop them, right? If they get there and you're interacting with them, you may not like it, but there's nothing you can do about it, right? Unless there's signs that say, recording prohibited. Unless permitted by, you know, in one village, surprisingly, you can't video or record any place unless you actually have a permit anywhere unless it's for personal use only this guy's content is for commercial use right he's con he's creating cash um but you know the cops pulled up and said oh, he, he, you know and, and at one point it says you know police parking only not fenced in but police and he walked right around the parking lot got everybody's patrol car and personal car and you know, able to just look around, and he drew five cops. Five cops came out. The sergeant came out. Hey, what are you doing? You know, and he's like, oh, I'm just going around, seeing where my taxpayer dollars are going. And he goes, okay, what are you doing with the video? You know, and he's like, I'm, I really don't have to tell you. And he's like, what do you mean you don't have to tell me? Of course you have to tell me. You know, at one point, I'm trying to be nice. He was a very senior officer who was used to the old school. And when I ask you your name, you tell me. And the guy goes, well, what's your name? And he goes, I have no obligation to tell you. And he's right. You don't have to. And he said, you're going to tell me your name. <laughs> and the guy's like, I'm not telling you my name. He says, no. And he says, oh, yes, you are. He says, no, I'm not. You're obligated to. You, when I call a cop, ask you. And he goes, no, I'm not. You know. And so the other junior cop's like, um, <laughs> like, you can see he's like pulling on his elbow. Hey, 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 hey. You know, like. But all that creates content, right? So it's yeah. interesting to, to, to see how it turns. Yeah. But uh, I, it's it's just it's contrary to how we train people to be sensitive to things that may be abnormal. Yeah, and you know yeah. we want them to respond appropriately. I think the I think even if the employees don't normally, I, I'll say they some overreact, right? Clearly, they, they immediately there was one video they pushed the panic button. Push the panic button. The alarms go off. The guy's like, what is going on, right? <laughs> Thought it was a fire. Had no idea. And then the cops and they have a security, they showed up. And and it's interesting to see how once the police officers got there, the police kind of had a sidebar with some of the, the employees and said, listen, he, he can do this. There's nothing preventing him from doing this. You, you can't keep somebody from recording in public space. So 
it, you know, at that point, there, when he goes to places and it says, you know, recording, and, and he's respectful of it because that is breaking the law. <laughs> you know, you go past that point with a recorder, you're breaking the law, right? They can arrest you for that. So, but um, yeah, it's interesting to see how they've they've monetized it now, and uh, I'm guilty of watching their videos. So he's probably making five or six pennies every time I <laughs> I click a video, you know. But it's interesting to see the reaction. You know, it's uh, and like I said, if your employees are not aware especially the cops, if there are cops that say, you can't do that, or I'm demanding your name, not really. No, you're not. You can demand it all you want. You're not getting it, you know? So, and on the FOIA requests, he never puts down their name, you know? And he's like, well, here's my, my email address. I'd like it electronically, you know? And ask always the same thing, salaries and, you know. Uh, but they, so he, if you publish those on a website, you don't even need to answer that request. So... True. A lot of times they'll say, oh, well, you can find that on our website. Right. And he'll say, okay, could you write the website down for me? I don't, I don't have it. And so most, you know. Yeah, then you just do it. Okay, it's Kingston Dash, you know, and, and but in some cases, mm -hmm. if, if it, he'll say, okay, well, I don't have access to a computer. And in City Hall, the guy's, well, I don't have an access to a computer. So well, you have a smartphone, it doesn't work. And he says, all right, then the library has access to computers. You can get free library computer access. All right, well, when he filed the FOIA request, I'd like a copy of the budget electronically. Then again, you know, we don't have hard copies anymore. Mm -hmm. those are, but FOIA request, you can get it, right? And it's just a simple email, or even in some cases, a link, right? You emailed a link to the guy. Right. So, but it, it's interesting, right? Like, so they've, they are going to find salaries yeah. online, budgets online. They want to know the complaint form, they want to yeah. file it. And, it. and in some cases, the complaint is as a result of the behavior of the employees or the police that respond, right? That's the difference, right? So, normally, you know, and I'll say it like this there's, there's they give them a pass fail in their eyes, right? And then there's always comments, wow, well, the cops were nice, but I could tell by his mannerisms. Right, stop, you know, they're just, yeah. but it's content, right? It, it, no different than any show you watch. And, but when you get somebody that overreacts and then the cops show up and say, uh-uh, they're within illegal rights, you know, and there are some cops that are great. Hey, how you doing? You know, and he's like, great. What's your badge number and name? Uh, Tinty124. And that doesn't always go over well. Some cops are like, what well, do you need to know my badge number and name? Oh, sir, you're, isn't your policy within the police department to, when addressing someone to, and you're, you're like thinking about it. Is it? Do I have to? And if the guy doesn't, well, I'm not telling you my name. Okay, I'd like to speak to your supervisor. Then the supervisor shows up, and again, depending on how it is, uh, hey, Sarge, uh, listen, I just that officer was kind of rude, and he's not giving me his name and badge number. Can I have yours? And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, Sarge and such and such, and uh, badge number, whatever. And he's like, okay, well, why can't you do that like him? Like, he's not hiding it. Why do you got to hide it? So and he just knows how to be. You know, he just yeah. knows how to get him there, right, yeah, yeah. without crossing the line. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, great content when they look. Know, but it's, it's, you, gotta, you know, you got to reverse that. I'm taking your phone out and start recording that. Yeah, well, they do that. Yeah. And, the, and the cops are like, bro, some of them are like, okay. You're on camera. I, right? I, on camera anywhere. I'm like, listen, we're all on camera. There's cameras in yeah. security. There's, that's not the issue. It, the issue isn't that the government's got the cameras, the issue is that the other right. person has the camera, right? We're on camera right now. People are watching us, right? So we don't feel unsettled by it because it's expected. It's not unusual or abnormal behavior. But like I said, if you walk as a member of the public, just think about it from your perspective, you look out your window right now and there's somebody walking down your street and they stop in behind your car, take a picture, your, they take a recording of your, and keep walking, you're going to be like, what are you doing? Uh, police department, please, right? And you're going to say someone is actual, uh, is acting unusual in my neighborhood. Cops roll up. Hey, bro, how you doing? Good. What's your badge? In, uh, all right, first thing, what's your name and badge number? What do you need to know that? <laughs> all right, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in a few minutes. You're listening to Kingston Community Radio on WGHQ Kingston. On your radio at 9.20 a.m. and 92.5 FM. And also online at mykcr.org. Hi, I'm Steve Thomas for Habitat for Humanity Restore. Habitat Restores are nonprofit home improvement stores and donation centers that sell new and gently used furniture, building materials, and appliances to the public at a fraction of the retail cost. 
The Ulster County Restore at 406 Route 28 in Kingston needs your donations. Call our hotline at 845-853-7499 to schedule your free pickup. And thanks. This is the story of Daniel, who was born two months early. His lungs weren't ready. His heart wasn't ready. His parents could only hope that one day he would leave the hospital healthy and they would all live happily ever after. Daniel's is just one of the more than 500,000 stories of babies born prematurely last year. You can help the March of Dimes stop premature birth and bring more babies home healthy. Learn how at marchofdimes.com. Working together for stronger, healthier babies. We all come together and stand together to serve our veterans. We invest in the latest technology. We take the time to train the next generation of doctors and nurses. We work together to make sure we heal their bodies and their minds. This is our mission. More than 300,000 of us working as one, together with families and loved ones. No matter where they live in this country, we'll be there. We stand strong, united. Stand with us in caring for our veterans. To battle is to fight, to struggle, to overcome, and ultimately for the Marine Corps, it means to win. There is no alternative. It's not just a statement of intent. It's a promise to our nation. A promise kept for more than two centuries. A promise of the Marines. Hi, my name is Jackie Lovezzo. I'm from Lake Katrine, and I support the Kingston Community Radio because it is an invaluable resource to the community and its residents. This portion of Kingston Community Radio is brought to you by Ulster Savings Bank. Visit their newest branch, conveniently located at the Ulster Commons Plaza in Lake Katrine. Experience the difference that local community banking offers with the convenience of another great location, easy access, plenty of parking, and a 24-hour ATM. Ulster Savings Bank, invested in community, invested in you. Member FDIC. They get right okay, we're back. I got Michelle Hinchy on the phone. So, uh, Michelle, are you there? Good morning. Welcome, Senator. Good morning. Fred, how are you doing? Thanks, Chief. I'm doing I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Doing really well. And Mayor Murphy's here with us. Hi, Michelle. Senator Michelle. Yeah. Hello. I wish I could be there in person with you guys, but we are back up in Albany session today. We're just trying to increase the volume here. We can't hear you too well. Yeah. We lost her. She's there. Michelle, you, we were having a little bit of technical problems on our side. No worries. Can you? Okay, we got you. All right. All right. Well, welcome. How you doing? I'm doing well. Up in Albany today for session. We started session officially really last two weeks ago with the State of the State, but our first full week last week. Uh, now we're back here uh, for a couple days this week. How are you guys doing? Doing really well. And uh, you had a pretty amazing year. Yes. And uh, much to celebrate. The governor signed a bunch of legislation that you were a significant part of recently. What was the count? Absolutely. 31? Was it, uh, let's see, we have the numbers here, 30, 30 of your bills making you the most active freshman uh, senator of 2021. That's impressive. That, well, thank you. And I'm really proud, too. I'm actually tied for the most bills signed last year with the dean of our, uh, of the Senate, uh, of the legislature, Senator Neil Breslin, who represents the city of Albany. He and I both had uh, 30 bills signed, which is actually the most bills of anyone in our in the Senate, which I'm really proud of. So awesome. we've been, you know, hit the ground running first year and been really effective, which is great. And again, all of those bills passed uh, the Senate with kind of wide bipartisan support. So we're really proud of all of them. That's an accomplishment in itself. <laughs> no question about it. No question about it. Good for you. That's a really nice achievement. You, and, uh, you get a bonus for that, like a senator bonus? <laughs> <laughs> just, just pride. Mayor, just try. Uh, that's bonus enough. <laughs> Any particular legislation you're more proud of than another and you want to share some highlights of? Sure. You know, again, we, we from 30, we there's a, a good amount. But again, all of them are actually to both uh, all bipartisan and also really substantive. You know, a couple of the ones that I'm most proud of, I think one of them we, we talked about on this show before is the Nourish New York bill, 
which uh, is a program that connects upstate farmers and farm fresh locally sourced food with food banks and food pantries across the state. So what it does is set a new market for our farmers who we know are struggling. Uh, we see it all the time uh, throughout Saugerties, Ulster County, and all of our, sur- our surrounding region, right? Farms are closing by the day, ones that, you know, I grew up going to their farmer's markets, not just farmer's markets in town, but going to the farm uh, and, and picking out produce. And uh, they've been really struggling. You know, the farms that get uh, federal subsidies and a lot of government support are not New York farms. Our farms are much smaller. They're small and mid-sized family farms. They're often, they often get left out uh, of those relief packages. And so uh, what our bill does is set a new uh, market, and the government, basically the state, will buy uh, food from farms and then distribute them to food banks and food pantries so that everyone, no matter where you live, what circumstances you have or may fall upon, uh, you can eat healthy locally, locally sourced food, which is really great. Yeah, that's a win-win. It is. That's awesome. Yeah, and amazing. then we've got we had a handful of bills, uh, four four bills that were signed actually that involved expanding healthcare access. Uh, one of them was expanding uh, or basically providing free menstrual products to shelters uh, throughout the shelter system through the state, uh, so that everyone can kind of live with dignity and, and get back on their feet, no matter what. Uh, circumstances there are. That was something that was offered to shelters in New York City, but it was not offered to shelters in other parts of the state. So now that is law. We are bringing equity uh, to people who are using our upstate shelter system. Uh, And we also created the first rural ambulance services task force, which, you know, uh, we know that our firehouses uh, are having uh, and our ambulance services are having a really hard time with recruitment and retention, costs, uh, and a lot of them are closing, you know, and we need uh, those services to be in our upstate communities. Uh, and so, you know, we know generally uh, what the problems are, but we need to get that data formally so that we can both work uh, regulatorily with the agencies, uh, but also legislatively to really strengthen uh, our upstate EMS services. Well, I think that became evident to that need through COVID as well. You know, right? Yeah. I mean, there are all the local ambulance services were so taxed during COVID. We, yep. you guys, recently expanded Diaz. Right? Diaz added a third yep. unit this year. So yeah, that that's a unique challenge. And uh, I know the geography of your district. So as much as we have challenges here in our part of your district, the western northern part of your district, I'm sure it has even steeper challenges to meet. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, we, I have the privilege of representing uh, 44 towns uh, across five counties. So we have a lot of, you know, a lot of the challenges are the same, uh, but a lot of them strike areas more than others. But what we see consistently uh, across the board throughout Ulster County, throughout Greene County, Albany, Schenectady, Montgomery, uh, is really, uh, you know, our emergency services and our ambulance services. Although, you know, Saugerties has done such a great job with Diaz, but, you know, Mayor, I believe it was you, you're right, you know, COVID really taxed and showed how fragile Mm -hmm. a lot of our first responding systems are, right? Because uh, so many calls, more people have moved into our communities, which are then using these services more uh, than they were previously. And I think what we're seeing is people have moved here permanently uh, because they know how now beautiful and wonderful and amazing and special our communities here are. And, uh, you know, that's great for a host of reasons, but a lot of our infrastructure wasn't prepared for this significant influx of people that we saw and our, our uh, emergency services being one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely clear evidence of the strain that they've experienced in the rise in demand for service. It's just, you know, it created challenges for those organizations. Plus those organizations were challenged by COVID as well. Right. You know, it was, yep. uh, the, I, I'm reviewing in my mind almost every fire district at one point or another had fairly substantial COVID outbreaks. The ambulance itself had, you know, COVID outbreaks, so they were challenged by it as well. What a crazy couple of years it's been. Oh, my you know, God. Uh, <laughs> trying to preserve these the essential services. You know, they weren't immune to any of the impacts. So, you know, when they – if they're – they run and ran into staff shortages and all those challenges just like all the other organizations, and they had to find a way to maintain that service and muddle through. It was a, it was a lot of – a lot of interesting work. And I hope in general people gain a greater appreciation for these services as well. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of us always took it for granted. 
you know, yeah, it's always been there. It's always been there. And I think COVID obviously has taxed all these services to the max. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have come to realize how valuable mm -hmm. they are. And I think that's probably a good, you know, going why these, that's a good thing. Right. That's why these, you know, it's good that these bills are being supported going forward. I mean, hopefully what we experienced the last two years is the worst case scenario for these services. Right. You know. Yeah, I hope you're right. Hope. Yeah. You, know, you know, hopefully it's going to get better for them. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, we saw just with, like you said, in our community, what our services did. And I mean, uh, you know, fortunately, we have a lot of great people in our community to help support these services financially. And, and, uh, you know, like I said, we always seem to do it right, you know, yeah. but, you know, you could just see it on their faces when you'd run into them. I mean, during these past two years, just how taxed yeah. these workers were. I remember during the early part of the first wave, especially, you know, no one, we were all, there was a big unknown about what COVID looked like and how successful we could protect ourselves. And those first responders were just going in. Yeah. You know, the, and in Sorgates, when the ambulance is uh, unavailable, the third out call at the time was handled by the local fire department. Fire departments, yeah. Those, those folks were volunteering and going into dangerous situations, which we didn't know a whole lot about, to uh, to make sure that the community was served. So I applaud what they did. It was, it was uh, you know, it was an honor to work with them. Absolutely. That was a good effort on your part as well, Michelle, trying to uh, – Acknowledge that and make sure they get the resources that will continue to make them successful. We well, well, thank you. Yeah, it's incredibly important for all, all the reasons you said. And, you know, we we know, especially in our firehouses and others, you know, the, the strains that they've been under for years, you know, and, and kind of declining uh, membership in many places and, you know, just the extreme challenges with trainings and restrictions and so many things that, you know, we have to think about how we can do this better uh, because I remember, you know, when I was in high school at Saugerties, you know, many of my friends were part of the volunteer fire service, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that was just kind of what, what you did in your family. And I know I, I talk to people now and I think that's, uh, especially for the younger generations has declined a bit. It's, it's mostly, you know, a lot of demand on time, you know, so how can we make, uh, how do we make it easier? How do we make it more, uh, enticing to, to do that and to join our fire services to really protect the community because we need it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a cultural component of uh, folks joining that is kind of expiring in a bad in a bad way, and uh, you see it across the fire districts and sorgities. You know, they, we're grateful for the members we have, but I think pretty much every district could use new members. So you know, yep. if folks are looking for a way to enjoy volunteering in their community. That's a great way to do it. Uh, they're all pretty unique organizations, and uh, the membership are. Uh, high-quality folks for the most part. So uh, if you're looking for a way to volunteer, that's a great way to do it. It's a great, that's a great uh, PSA. Yeah, we did a little PSA <laughs> this morning. We've had a little uptick in the village. You know, it did go through a period where we had, you know, not many new young kids, but now we have the junior program, and that's that seemed to help us a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah, you know, we have so many guys that start off as junior members at 14, 15, and 16, and, you know, now they're turning 18, and uh, so it seems like we're coming back a little bit. I don't want to. You know, cause I just I, I actually remember from the last fire we just had. I remember seeing a lot of the young kids there. That yeah, day. there was a lot of yeah. young folks, there. and that was good. I mean, across all fire departments, not just Sargates. You know, Cedar Grove, Glasgow. It was, it was good to see some young kids out there. And uh, like you said, it's you know the older guys are getting older. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, it's the culture. It's not there like like Michelle was saying back when we were in school. Well, obviously we were in school. Well, well, a while ago. Well, I'll go than her, but, you know, the culture's not there to join the fire department as a teenager like it used to be, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know. Well, that's, you know, and that's what we're looking at, too, at the state level of how can we make that easier for people, right? Because we know, again, t uh, time is, is limited, and there's a lot of demand, especially on our volunteer houses uh, for time, and so how can we be helpful at a state level to, you know, relieve some of that where we can make it easier make training more accessible provide other opportunities for training as opposed to some of the stringent pieces that are there now of only certain days and weeks uh, of the year you know how can we make this more flexible is so that more people have the ability to do it because a lot of people want to right. you know but they just they just struggle uh with if there's only one weekend you can do a training course and you can't go that weekend you know then you're out so yeah. Yeah. uh how can we be more thoughtful at a state level so that more people have the opportunity to join 
What about, I mean, one of the thoughts ever come up to intertwine it into the education system, you know, make it an opportunity for kids that are in high school to, you know, get credit towards, you know. If you took firefighter one, give them credit for it. Right. I mean, somehow tie it into education and uh, that way they're fulfilling the requirements for high school as well as learning to be a volunteer, you know. I don't know. It's a stretch, obviously, but I'm just trying to think of a way to entice the teenagers, you know, especially the ones who, you know, maybe after high school aren't going to go on to college and are going to get a job locally and, you know, uh, some kind of yep, incentive that way. Those, those ties are always really important. Mm-hmm. You know, providing people those pathways in, in early education is great. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason, you know, we have a lot of, you know, old Boys and Girls Club as well. It has, you know, I know Dan's got a lot of programs going, you know, for kids working in the uh, hospitality. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they're doing a really nice job in Kingston uh, with that. Doing a great job. Yeah, they are. Absolutely. Well, Dan kills it. He yeah, he's my friend, but I'm going to, you know, give him props anyways, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> he deserves it. They're yes, doing, he does. They have some great partnerships, you know, with Joe B's uh, and others and the cooking partnerships. They do They do a lot of really great stuff there. They really do. Uh, it's and, exciting uh, to see. Yeah, and uh, just you got to applaud the creativity to come up with those opportunities for those young folks to, you know, test the work. I think it's pretty, yeah. pretty impressive. Yep. You know, we were really proud. Sorry, we were really proud. Uh, we gave them uh, a funding grant as part of a gun violence prevention. We got a, a, some money for gun violence prevention, and we targeted the Boys and Girls Club to be able to expand their programs and be open on Fridays and Saturdays, which they weren't able to do consistently, uh, which they'll be able to do now, which is really exciting, which means they can prove their uh, programs and their services to even more people on some of the nights that they really need it. Yeah, Saturdays are huge. I know Dan and I have been talking, you know, he, and he, he on his own has tried to keep surrogates open on Saturdays when he can. I mean, because, you, you know, it goes to a lot of programs that we have, you know, we, you know, the school lunch program and the back, you know, you have these programs and it's great that the kids have all this Monday through Friday, but then, you know, you're always wondering what happens on the weekends, some of these kids. Mm-hmm. So having a Boys and Girls Club to go to, to get a meal on a weekend, you know, it's, and, you know, and nowadays parents are not just working Monday through Friday, parents are working seven days a week and they need a place for their children. So, uh, yeah, Dan, Dan's been so forward thinking with the Boys and Girls Club and uh, I was just talking to him yesterday and he's under, he's in a stressful time of year right now. You know, he's got a lot going on and uh, you can just hear it and I'm like, he, he's always on the go. Yeah, it's good. It's very good. So we're going to run out of time with you, but I want to give you a chance to talk about the broadband okay, legislation yes. too because that was uh, that's a goal we all share and I know in Sargates we could benefit and we have some creative things happening to improve it, but I think this bill will be helpful to us and to many of the other communities. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, thank you. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, – lack of access to broadband and some of the challenges uh, that all of our communities are facing. And it's something, you know, I ran on talking about how we need to bring uh, broadband equity uh, across the state. And, you know, the previous governor uh, was touting that we were covered, New York State was covered at a rate of 98%. Uh, and if you live without internet, you know uh, other people who do as well, and you know that number was just not accurate. Uh, and the reason they were able to say 98% was because, uh, they were using how, uh, census tracts to track data as opposed to household level data, uh, which for if you're in a really populated city, census tracts are a good barometer for coverage, not as good a barometer for more uh, suburban and rural areas like mm-hmm. the ones that we live in. And so uh, that data was, was inaccurate. Uh, so we actually did two things this year uh, that I championed specifically to make sure that we could actually build out uh, broadband infrastructure appropriately to people who need it. The first one was putting in the budget the first broadband mapping study, household level data mapping study uh, to really understand where the gaps are so that we can then put money, specifically money from the infrastructure bill that we're getting, the federal infrastructure bill, to build out in those areas that need, uh, that need it. Right. Uh, If we don't know exactly where the gaps are, if we're touting 98 percent, but don't know uh, that there's holes within those census tracts, you know, people are going to be left behind on the wrong side of the digital divide. So uh, I'm really excited uh, that that study is now underway. The PSC is doing it as we speak. Uh, And through uh, advocacy with my office, originally the survey was done specifically online, which you can imagine for all kinds of challenges if you're trying to do a broadband survey. Uh, to yeah, there's a cruel the irony challenge. embedded. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. True. There's a cruel irony yep. in that. You're right on. 
Yep. So uh, my office led a letter uh, with my colleagues calling for the addition of a hotline as well as information by mail to be sent, uh, which the PSC did. Uh, so now, again, that is underway. And if anyone listening uh, wants to fill out that survey or wants more information, needs help filling out that survey, call my office. Uh, I'll share that number uh, at the end. Uh, but call our office. We're here to help. Uh, happy to help uh, you with any of those questions or, or making sure you can complete it. And then the legislation on broadband that I sponsor that I'm really proud of is uh, our, this bill on uh, utility poles. So uh, it does two things. One, as all of you know, I'm sure uh, independent broadband companies have to opt in and negotiate uh, to attach to each individual utility pole uh, separately, uh, individually. So uh, that's if you're building out uh, broadband in uh, areas that would need, uh, you know, either rural areas, again, suburban areas, you need to attach to a lot of different utility poles to reach different people, uh, having to negotiate rates for each individual poll is really challenging uh, and takes up a lot of time. And so what our bill does twofold, the first part is makes it so that municipalities can opt into one contract uh, and they don't, and nobody has to then negotiate by poll. They can just negotiate an entire section, uh, which I think will be really helpful. And two, uh, broadband companies, especially are the ones that are building out in our areas are usually more independent uh broadband companies that operate in grants. And so their uh, funding structures are really limited. And uh, utility poles have been charging them uh, in order to attach. They've been charging them the full replacement cost of uh, full utility poles. And so in our bill, we have restructured uh, the attachment cost so that it is more affordable for, util- for broadband companies to attach to utility poles to actually build out uh, in our area. So it'll be more economical uh, for the small broadband companies, which will then bring internet faster to more homes across the state. Perfect. In the make ready and all that, there's a, you know, so if I'm trying to be uh, an insurgent broadband company coming into a community that's served by perhaps Verizon and perhaps Spectrum, Spectrum and Verizon's motivation to make room for my service to compete with them is not exactly on the up. So the legislation there to protect it is very important. Absolutely, yeah, we're 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 proud of that, and we think it'll be really helpful uh, to make sure that more of a parts of our communities are getting internet service. Uh, and just as I said, I would share our phone number if anybody wants to call with any questions on any of this legislation or wants help with the broadband survey. Our phone number is eight four five three three one three eight one zero. Call us anytime. I imagine it's important for folks to participate in the survey so we get as accurate a picture of the data as we can, correct? Absolutely. You know, if you don't have uh, internet service, if you don't have reliable internet service, if you're having uh, issues with the cost of internet services or fees, uh, call, you know, because that we're collecting and the PSC is collecting all of that data. And the more people who participate, the more accurate information we'll have to make sure that communities like Socrates are represented in that survey. Perfect. Perfect. So we, we do have an exciting project that's going to land in one part of the village. And uh, that might be uh, a fiber to the home project. It's uh, part of a, a collaboration between the town and a private developer. And uh, hopefully that's going to be successful. That's um. That's exciting. Yeah, uh, I can't remember the name of the company, but it's the Pesh family. Okay. Yeah, the fiber company, and they have an investor willing to do a trial, and it's going to be market in Elm. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. When well, are you going to fill me in on this? I just did. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I just did, but I feel like if that Great, yeah. is a successful model, yep. it'll be pretty clear, and the. That'll prove the case for an expansion of a fiber to home throughout the community. Yep. And oh, that's great. There's rural parts of Sorties that don't have really any connection to service at all. So if we can uh, create a good economic model in the dense part of our, parts of our community, uh, we could leverage that and hopefully find subsidy to create that for those rural areas yep. as well. That's great. Yeah. So pretty exciting. That's great. Yeah. Um, and before. And I, uh, one, well, I do want to say one thing before, um, I know we're getting close to time here, but we are doing our second annual 
Valentine's for Seniors event. So anyone we are uh, working with, uh, we're collecting Valentine's Day cards for community members who would like to, from community members who would like to send a greeting to a local nursing home. Uh, we participated with uh, a few nursing homes in Saugerties last time. It, they were so well received. The cards were so beautiful. Uh, so if anybody wants to participate, we are partnering with schools. Uh, as well. So if anyone listening is a teacher uh, or has uh, any kids or grandkids uh, in the school system, you know, bring this to uh, the teachers. We've shared this with all the superintendents, uh, but we're collecting uh, Valentine's cards. You can also just do them at home if you want and then drop them off at our Kingston office, which is 721 Broadway, Suite 150. Uh, but we're collecting them and we will be uh, handing them out to nursing homes across, uh, across our district, but across Ulster County. So who's eligible to participate in that? Uh, anyone. You know, we've been, uh, this last year was a partnership that we did with uh, our school system. Uh, and uh, kids were creating Valentines that we then picked up and distributed to nursing homes, uh, again, across uh, our district, but many in Saugerties. But if anyone wants to participate in creating Valentine's Day cards, they can drop, bring them to our office in Houston. Oh, wow. And cool. we distribute yeah. them. Very cool. I did. I did read about that last night. It was interesting. It yeah. Was very cool. Nice. I didn't. Uh... Yeah. It was. It was really well received. And you know, of course, think about this time last year. We are right in the middle uh, of COVID too, yeah. and kind of the winter surge. And so, a lot of people, uh, those in our nursing homes, weren't able to see their families or their grandkids, uh, nieces and nephews. And so, uh, this was a really great thing. It brought a lot of uh, joy and. and kind of happiness in kind of a dark time. And so we're going to do it again, uh, make sure that people live uh, in those who aren't able to see their families or maybe aren't able to be home uh, can still get some Valentine's Day love. Very cool. I, somehow I wasn't aware of that. I apologize. but uh, I wasn't until last night. So last I'm, night, I'm okay. glad you brought it up. Yep. Yeah, good. Good. Well, participate now. We're collecting them and we'll be distributing them. Or if we need all of them uh, brought to us by February 9th. It's a Wednesday, uh, so that we can get them out on time. Okay, but so still... any time until now to February 9th. I'm going to send it to my wife at her school and see what, <coughs> see if we get some kids in her school doing it. Yeah. 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 yeah imagine. Uh, That'd be great. Yeah. If the young folks make those cards, they're going to be pretty special. You can make me one, Fred. I can make you one, man. Okay, thanks. I'll work on it. All right. It'll look like I was in kindergarten when I made it. <laughs> so I appreciate that. <laughs> But, yeah, all the kids who participated last time, they were really great. The cards were beautiful. Uh, and, again, they were really well-received. So we're, we're excited to do this program again. Awesome. Yeah, that's exciting. Very exciting. So today you are uh, – I'm sure you have a thick agenda of new proposals you're going to work on. Uh, I don't know if you could do 30 again. That was really ambitious. But, uh, <laughs> but it, was, it was ambitious. But I got to say we have a lot in the works. Uh, everything from I know last time I was on, we talked about the Central Huston uh, Utility Estimation Bill, uh, which we're working on. We have got two bills updating the state's procurement laws, which have not been updated since the 1970s. Uh, that's <laughs> ensuring that our state agencies that buy food can buy New York State local food or incentivized to buy food from our New York State farmers, uh, as well as in, uh, incorporating a values-based system for farms uh, or food vendors that are using uh, good labor practices, good climate practices, animal welfare practices. Um, you know, we're working on a bunch of different things uh, this year that we're really excited about. All right. All right, we're going to cut you there because we're just about out of time, and it always is a quick half hour. Thank you for your time this morning, Michelle, and uh, we look forward to you being on air with us again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. See you, Michelle. All right, Mary, thank you, and Lawrence, that'll do yep, it. Good job thank today, you, guys, listeners. and... Uh, I won't be here next week, but you got, is Greg going to be back next week? Yes. All right, great. So I will. Uh, Dan will be on next week. I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Okay. Take care, everyone. We'll be back tomorrow with Thunder Thursday with uh, Don Williams and Tony Marmo.